and hello once again. You are listening to the voice of Free Arcadia. And got another great, exciting episode for you today. But first, just uh, say hello to everybody here with us. Uh, firstly, my trusty companion, Chad. Chad, how are you doing today? I'm doing peachy. How about you? Peachy Keen as well. We got a beautiful day here, and we're talking about a movie that has a lot of beauty in it, for sure. Uh, namely, the female face that David, David Merrill, is holding up from the Let's Anime blog. How are you doing, David? I'm doing great. Happy summer, everybody. Today we have a very interesting episode because we're going to dive really deep into something that is, for the most part, completely out of grasp for English-speaking audiences. And it's a, kind of a bold turn of topic for the episodes because typically I like to talk about things that I can say, hey, go and check this out. But I find this to be exceptionally interesting. Potentially my take on why it's so interesting is going to be different than everybody else's. But it's still something that's worth talking about, uh, where it comes from, how it came to be, and what its impact was. And there's Kitty right there. What's yeah. Kitty's name? Mubert Mumphrey. Mubert Mumphrey, great. Vice great. President Mubert Mumphrey. <laughs> Vice President? Who's the president? Is that you? I guess it would be uh, LBJ, Lyndon, <laughs> Lyndon Baines Kitty or something like that. I don't know. Uh, yeah, something like that, yeah. But yeah, let's dive in. Queen Melania. This movie was released in 1982, okay? And it's based on the 1980 Matsumoto manga that was written as a prequel to Galaxy Express 3.9. And some, including uh, Julian, who I spoke with uh, about it on the last podcast, go check that out where we go in depth on uh, Queen Emeraldus, uh, where who kind of makes an appearance here. We'll, we'll get into that. Uh, stated that this might be, this manga might be Matsumoto's masterpiece, uh, namely stating that it has a clear beginning, middle, and end. And... Uh, has a very fleshed out seemingly uh, story and very inspired sci-fi ideas that are sometimes grabbed from previous entries, but uh, displayed in a, a fresh way in many ways. Right after 1980, uh, we have in 1981, the Galaxy Express 3.9 anime series winding down. And after getting over a hundred episodes out of it, it seems studios were keen to try and get another maybe 100 episodes out of the hottest property that Matsumoto had, which was Queen Melania. And, but interestingly, it deviates severely from the manga in many different ways. Feel free to jump in whenever you want on this. I was going to say uh, a lot of Americans might have seen this show as part of Captain Harlock and Queen of a Thousand Years. Back in the mid-1980s, Harmony Gold got the 78 Captain Harlock series and the 82... Uh, Queen Millennia television series. And depending on uh, how Carl Masek was feeling on whatever day you asked him the question, he would describe, well, I sold 78 episodes. I had to find 78 episodes. We don't have 78 episodes of Captain Harlock. We got to mm -hmm. find another show. Bam, here's Queen Millennia. Yeah, and Toei had them over a barrel on episodes of SSX. Yeah. yeah. Which, uh, and that wouldn't, that wouldn't have, have even helped. equaled yeah. up. Yeah. It was like a, just an episode shy. So they would, they maybe could have worked with it, but uh, they were also hot off the success of making Robotech. Yeah, Robotech and was a big hit. They were feeling maybe a bit emboldened that they could do this to any if multiple you, series. If you watch the, the, the Harmony Gold show, it is, you know, they always rewrite these things, but they literally took bits from this show and bits from that show and stuck them together. Characters mm -hmm. purportedly interact. It's They're so disparate because these series are literally 1,000 years apart from yes, one another. Yes. Um, yes. And there's there's definitely a, a lot of issues there. You say a lot of people, I you know, maybe, it, from what I understood, it got pretty limited distribution. Well, it aired in, in my market, obviously. Okay, and, uh, yeah. So you grew up watching it. I grew up, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, would, I, taped it, I taped it every day. Even though it's not necessarily the greatest expression, not the greatest localization, I still envy you it to was be 19, able to grow up with it. It was 1985. You took what okay. you could get. Yeah, this was absolutely. It. Like, turning on I was television. lucky to... 
I was lucky to have like Ronin Warriors, where it's like one of the most faithfully yeah. translated localized animes. No, ever, they so. were not doing that in the 80s. No. Yeah. No. This anime series in 81 on Queen Melania, uh, Melania, I almost say Melania sometimes too. Like, well, what's great about the show is that it, it really teaches you how to spell that word. Yeah. If you write about absolutely. Melania, you are going to learn yep. how to spell that word. Two L's, two N's. Yep. yep. The, the movie serves to retell the anime series, but even with a, a different ending there as well. So we have all these kind of offshoots from the manga, each one differing seemingly wildly. Uh, we have that a bit in Galaxy Express 3.9. Happens all the time, guys. All the time. It, it definitely does. Um, but for some reason, this deviation to me leaves it, in my opinion, lacking a bit. And, and I will definitely get into why I feel that. Um, and perhaps you can explain to me why you feel the, deci the decisions were correct. So this was directed by uh, Masayuki Akahi. Uh, Akahi? I'm probably pronouncing A it wrong. Akehi. Akehi? Akehi. Akehi. Yeah, he worked, uh, he worked, he also, if this film might look similar to the 1980 film Cyborg 009, Legend of the Super Galaxy. It yep. appears a lot of DNA with that film. And it's because yeah. it, it's got the same director, it's got the same character designer, it's got the same mechanical designer, it's got the same DP. Uh, they both have a really similar look, not just with character designs, but with mechanical designs and with the landscapes and the settings and the backgrounds. They've all, yes. they both have this sort of dreamlike, hazy, rainbowish. They're both really long movies that are, uh, they're slow, they're slow movies. Mm -hmm. They're slowly paced. They're deliberately paced, let me put it like that. But it's the 1980s. Every anime film from this period is slow as hell. In some degrees, yes. Uh, they're they're I all too long. I said about the three nine movies that I think if they would have taken some of these animations from twos to ones, I, cause I do that, I'll cut up things for gifts and uh, it'll sort of speed up the animation, make it look more fluid. If we had that and we could have cut about 15 minutes out of Galaxy Express, just speeding up some of the animation and or making can, it a can, tinge more fluid. You could do what Roger Corman did and cut every cat out of that film. I disagree, sir. <laughs> he, he cut every cat out of that film. However, Galaxy Express right. was, it got a big deal United States cinema release in theaters. It got... Uh, One of the first animes, yeah. I believe it might be the first anime to touch uh, American theaters. No, no, but it's... I read, I might have read wrong. No, no, though, geez. Alakazam the Great was like, what, 1961? Don't even know about it, so I'll oh. have to look into that. Definitely worth a watch. And then you got uh, you got your Gulliver's Travels Beyond the Moon, right? Which is a terrific film. Hayao Miyazaki sure. worked on that bad boy. I'll Gosh. need to look a bit more into that. But uh, Masayuki did storyboards for 16 episodes of Galaxy Express 39. And in addition to the Cyborg 009 movie that David mentioned, he worked on uh, Tatake uh, Ramenman, yeah. uh, Saint Seiya, a uh, movie for them, and a mashup movie, Grendizer, Get a Robo G, Great Mazinger, Battle, 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 Giant Sea Beast. Beast. Yes. Which is a, a, just what it says on the tin, guys. <laughs> just it's quite, wanna, it says quite a lot. It's wanna, basically a plot synopsis. If you want a film that is nothing but action, that movie is all meat, no filler. But it's like 20, <laughs> it's 25 minutes long. Uh, and as well, it was written by uh, Keisuke Fujikawa, who had written on... Uh, several previously adapted Matsumoto works. He did 58 episodes of Galaxy Express. He worked on mm. Space Battleship Yamato. He worked on uh, Legend of Marine Snow, which is uh, another piece of Matsumoto history that was lost to us. And perhaps most recently, Submarine Super 99, he was a writer on. He, so that guy, that's, he, he has worked on hundreds, literally hundreds of projects. He's That's not. three decades of Liegeverse projects right Alone. there. Yeah. So he did fifty-five yeah. episodes or fifty-three episodes of Mazer Z. I yeah, mean, quite prolific. This right. guy is Gren hardest working man in show business. That guy, Brendizer, and also worked on Ultraman. Yep, on a few different series of that. One of the more notable things, something I hear a lot about Queen, uh, the Queen Melania movie, is the music, which was written by Kotaro, who was a popular New Age synth musician. It's Kitaro. Uh, Kitar Kitaro. How did I? You said Ko Taro. Did I say Ko? Oh, okay, yeah, I Let's did misspell. Let's go back to Kitaro. the tape. He's a, a really influential uh, electronic music composer. 
Um, internationally successful. He's won Grammys. Uh, he did the soundtrack to Heaven and Earth, the Oliver Stone film. Right before he did the Queen Millennia soundtrack, he did the soundtrack to an NHK documentary called Silk Road that lasted 17 years. So people in Japan knew who he was. He was kind of a yes. big deal. He was in a band, a, a, a kind of a spacey prog band yeah. called uh, the Far East Family yeah. Band before that as a th synth musician kind of splitting off to do his own thing. And, and this music is really, to me, it's, it's kind of the soundtrack for something like Ancient Aliens. Oh, very it's much It's this so. very sparse and swelling uh, OST that if, just if you were listening, fills the whole thing. If you were listening to public radio at two o'clock in the morning, you might've heard a show called Hearts of Space that is an ambient new age electronic music. And Kataro is the, the, the number one most valuable player <laughs> in that field. So Americans would have known, um, I don't wanna say every American, but certainly people in the music, they'd know who Kataro was in 82, 83, 84. And he got, uh, Geffen Records started distributing his albums in the States in 1985. So you could go to the record store and find the soundtrack to Queen Millennia. In, but in not America. the not the film itself. You could not find the film enough. itself, and you still yeah. can't find the film itself. Right. I will say the uh, last time. Speaking of that, the last time I've seen this film uh, in the wild was in the the Asian mall here. It was a a gray market Chinese uh, DVD that I yeah. did not buy because I am foolish. <laughs> but <laughs> you so. done goofed. Sure. It didn't have any, it didn't have the, the bad Chinese English subtitles. So something that's not really mentioned in the movie specifically is that this uh, is based in the very distant year of 1999. And we know how much Matsumoto loves his three nine motif there. So it, it makes sense. Uh, but maybe maybe overshooting his view of the future. I, I love how Tokyo 1999 looks. It, it's yeah. Like, they just started construction immediately and have not stopped for 20 <laughs> years. It's like, no. Well, they were experiencing the miracle economy, as it were, right. which was uh, in many ways set off by the works of Matsumoto, Tezuka, uh, these people kind of inspiring uh, an entire generation after being really brutalized during World War II. They were, uh, uh, they would purport hope. They would send messages of hope out to youth and give them. I was going to say that optimistic. That bubble economy was just going to keep on, yeah, keep on swelling. Perhaps, perhaps a bit of delusion there, but uh, it makes for an interesting setting. Well, does anybody else have anything to say about Queen Melania in general to kind of get us set up here? Chad, well, do you have any thoughts on it? Um, I'm here to learn. That's what I'm doing. I'm <laughs> All right, just learn, getting learn into this. So, Jacob, sure. Jacob, I was going to ask you. Uh, you have not seen the Queen of Millennia television series, right? Correct. No, I, I, I kind of skimmed through the first couple episodes to see, and I read probably about four or five issues of the manga. I will say, um, I, I will say, going into this film, um, it, and this is a weakness. It's it it's kind of assuming you're going to know what happens. Yeah, it assumes a lot. Like I um, like the Macross movie in many ways is similar, but I think that does a better job of like laying everything out, regrounding everything, and to fit two hours. Queen Millennia is kind of like you know what's going on. Just just you know you know. Yeah, sure, go ahead. And it's so it it really infuriates me because. It's so drastically different from three nine. It, it's like they had this this the blueprints to make this work. And I wonder where's Rintaro? Why is Rintaro not with us anymore in these Matsumoto movies? Rintaro was working on uh, probably working on Harmageddon because Harmageddon was going to come out in 1983. Spe a busy man, I'm sure. Speaking of new age, new agey films, but. We'll get into that later. Let's move right along into the plot. We start off with this long, slow shot of multicolored light sort of pulsating in a spacey distance beyond the fog. I, I feel like this sequence is a fair warning. Yeah. It's, no. it's like, guys, if you are not into this, <laughs> nope out right now. Yeah. It, it, <sighs> there's, a, there's a film called Hellhound Liner 0011. That's a kid's movie from 1973, two. And it's, it opens with cutaway diagrams of giant mechanical insect monsters. 
and the soundtrack is like screech honk screech and it's like mm -hmm. warning parents leave theater immediately <laughs> warning so yeah, well, this, they, this movie is, is this kind for of kids like, or no is what? this for kids or no queen, queen melania in general you wonder is this for kids? Do they understand who their audience is? Because it, contra it, it contrasts the manga so drastically where we immediately have the main character meeting an explosion, which we'll get into. Yeah. yeah. But it, it, it's Matsumoto seemed to understand who he was talking I, to. I feel like this film like does not. This film is, is aimed at um, the target demo is probably about 17 female like this, this extremely specific target demo, mm. you know? I, and it does not feel like a movie for, like you can see Galaxy Express, it's aimed at a kid. Kids watch yeah. this, go, oh, look at this, you know? But this does yeah. seem like it's aimed at a more mature, uh, less less Cosmo gun uh, needing audience. They don't quite need the- Yeah, there's not gun really fights. a gun the whole time, even when you almost get a gun, uh, but we'll get to that. Uh, and we move from this kind of, uh, this abstract shot of pulsing light to these pan panning shots of these slug-like spheroids that are hovering over a, a desolate ice world. So very abstract. I'm a little bit interested at this point just because I'm getting a little bit of Matsumoto sci fantasy design. That's hooking me a bit. And we get this diatri this this sort of monologue exposition. Once in a millennia, a time of life comes and a detached male and female voice are kind of very vaguely setting up the plot for yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. And after a lot of that and a little bit of intro music, we cut to Yayoi. Am I gonna annoy anybody by saying it that way? Yayoi, I think that's, that's, Yayoi. that's correct. I think. Yayoi Yukino uh, being awoken by a work call from Amamori. I don't know if we're given his first name in this. She accidentally calls herself Yukino Kun. Like I, I want, of, I want to point out, she has a terrific apartment. Oh, absolutely! Just a this, beautiful she is apartment. Well, so very spoiled by Tokyo, this. Tokyo 1999. Uh, real estate is awesome. This contrasts the manga as well, though, because yeah. in the manga she lives with an old grandmother. Well, this is you know, this is why you're going to like the TV show, because <laughs> in the TV she does show, have a little more of that, she, and they really go deep into the 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 bamboo princess business of I've been adopted by this. Really nice. Yes, we're going to talk about that. Well, she lives in, in uh, with an older couple who are her her adopted parents. They run a ramen shop. There's a lot of seeds. Mm -hmm. so let's go get some ramen, you know. And yeah, and, um, Matsumoto classic sort of approach. There, got to get a good meal in. And she is awoken by Amamori. She accidentally calls herself Yukino Kun instead of Yayaoi Kun. Why is this? It's never really explained. Is she learning Japanese? Does she not really? Is this not her first language? Uh, what is be what is being told to us there? Or is she just so tired she doesn't get it? I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's that, and it's not really was, nothing to look she was into. Up really late running the world. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't even know how to to refer to herself in the Japanese custom, which is interesting there. Uh, she, but yes, she's been working the night shift. Give her a break, man. Yeah. He's, he's saying, you're going to rot yourself. You've been sleeping so much. So this guy's kind of a, a ball buster, so to speak, uh, as a boss. She's woken up and she'll, she'll, she has to go into work early now after working the late shift. But she walks into this cloaked control room, which kind of, it fades from a regular bedroom into a sort of liege meter filled sci-fi space. And they just do it by turning the lights down and then bringing yeah. the lights back up. You're expecting like everything is going to flip around, you know, like it's like it's a, a Thunderbirds kind of control room or something. But now they, no. we just turn the lights off and bring the lights back up. And that's well, economic. they're more advanced than that. They, they don't need yes. that kind of technology. It's that's old school. Um, and she has this sort of magical girl transformation into Queen Melania. It's not one for one, a magical girl thing, but it's definitely a bit of an implication. We even get like this swirling light and sound effect I, going I, around her. I feel like it's a deliberate choice on the part of this film to make this sort of stuff a lot more fantastical and supernatural and fairy tale-ish. And it's As like a, you- And it's, it's in direct contrast to the television show, which is nuts and bolts science type fiction. Mm -hmm. For the most part. I mean, there's a little bit of this magical stuff. Or or fantasy, rather. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Instantly, mystery killed. They have destroyed 
a, a big part of the mystery of Queen Melania. Who is Queen Melania? Even in the TV series, they give us a, an episode to get accustomed with who the people are before they say, bam. And even as an adult, it's obvious. But this, why is this made for old people? It should be made for children because that's who Matsumoto wrote for. Why are we adapting this children's story into this mid-teens brooding weirdness? I I am I, let down there personally. Um, You'll have to ask some Japanese kids about that. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to ask some producers too. That's who I really well, want to yeah, talk that's, to. That's again, it's like it's a deliberate choice to get a guy like Kitaro to do your music. I mean, he was not. T kid, children were not buying Kitaro records. You know, the, the, he was an adult yeah. composer. Adults were buying his records. Much prefer the jazzy uh, soundtrack of Galaxy Express. And she gets a call from La Metal, which we find out is her home planet. There is the new Queen Melania giving her a call, basically saying, hey, Prometheum 2, which is her name, uh, apparently on that planet, uh, I'm, I'm coming, whether you like it or not. And uh, get the place cleaned up. Yeah, I'm about to move in. But this is the only time we really hear from her the whole movie. Uh, we, we, I think we see her later she and I don't want to- She shows up, yeah. She shows up, yeah, okay, so that is her. And that's to the level of uh, we're why. Gonna, well, go, okay, <laughs> the, 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 the gist of this film and, and what we're getting at is that every thousand years, planet Lamatal is, is in some crazy orbit, way out, way out, way, it, it's in a crazy orbit. Yeah, it thousand comes, year orbit. Every thousand years it comes close to Earth. Planet Lamatal warms up, the people wake up, they get to be alive for a little while, and then it goes away from the sun and freezes again. Yeah. And at the same time, the the Lamatal queen who actually runs planet Earth, that's when her term of office is over and you get a new queen to run planet Earth. But this new queen is just Well, well, here's here's a, the key. An empty character. Apparently Nobody on Earth for the past history of, of mankind has noticed this planet swinging by every thousand years. A thousand yeah. years is not a long time. Well, like, we do have in, in even the manga, oh, they, and, they, and there's a little bit yeah. here, they well, say, Egypt okay, people kind of are aware of what's going on, but this is deep hidden in, in mysterious you text, and, hide and we don't have modern scientific records that any scientist is looking at with any degree of seriousness. A thousand, that would be the job of the anthropologist. 1000 AD, we had everything you need, man. <laughs> it's like, check that out, Pope, you know. I don't have a <laughs> I don't have a copy of When Worlds Collide by Philip Wiley. <laughs> I do have a copy of After Worlds Collide, which is his absolutely insane sequel. Okay. It gets crazy. But well, you know, the late 50s, When Worlds Collide, oh, there's this planet coming from another solar system. It's gonna smash into the earth. What are we gonna do? So that informs pretty much, I'd say, the first half of the film and a good chunk of the television show. Planet Earth is gonna be destroyed. This Lama Tal is gonna smack right into it. What are we going to do? Yeah. And even that becomes a little hazy later on. It's hazy. Uh, Hajime uh, creeps through the window and he's washing the windows of the apartment, uh, getting uh, an unintentional peek at, uh, I, I, at Yayaoi. I want to say in, child labor oh, laws in 1999 yeah, Tokyo. A little odd. Existent. In the manga, it's more vague uh, what his age is. He's not so purported to be a young student he might just be a tiny dude he's like a, we have in Otoko Oiden he's a junior high school kid he has junior high school friends he goes to high school but he's about the same size as uh, Nabuto I think or whoever's in Otoko Oiden well, where so he's a, an 18 year old kid so they just uh, don't grow. Liege Matsumoto is a, is a shorter man his self inserts inserts are typically short Totoro short etc cetera, etc cetera. and Hajime means the beginning and this is very appropriate because Queen Melania is written as a prequel to Galaxy Express 3.9, and we can kind of see this as the beginning of the Lazyverse proper, or at least from a modern, what we would consider modern perspective. Fun little thing I noticed there. That's the, uh, I want to say 1999 would be the earliest he's set. Like mm. Galaxy Express is way in the future. Captain Harlock is 2976 AD. Sure. Mm -hmm. I don't know when uh, Mirazer Bond is based, but I think it might be after that, uh, which sets up the entire explanation of Tokinawa and the Ring of Time. 
and he's been working lots of different jobs to afford this 4D microscope, uh, which implies that you can uh, view an object, you can see microscopic time, which that's, is an interesting concept. That's, that's just the brand name. And he wants to study plants to regrow the vegetation on Earth, but uh, Yaoi shows him his test scores, which implies that she's his teacher, which hmm. is uh, new for the entire. She's picking think, up. She's picking up animes. a little extra money. To tutor. Yeah, that's yeah. that's that's new thing. I don't think that's the in the world, series. Definitely know, not in the manga. She's got to make that extra cash. Yeah. Yeah. She, you know? And and everybody's out on the mess mission to uh, make some more skrill. Hmm. But uh, Yowie's saying she's she's about to be done with this teacher job. You know, she's working two jobs. She's working late shift and yeah. getting called in early. She's got to help her parents out. out. You know. They don't and have so much money running in restaurants. I guess <laughs> that's what I like uh, about that TV show. It's really grounded. I mean, I I know that one of the things you didn't like about this movie is how not grounded it is. <laughs> TV, no, the TV show is is works pretty hard. It's it's pretty solid day to day Tokyo. Well, I had to look into the TV show a bit more. Um, Definitely give it a watch. You know, I will yeah. say about the TV show. Every time Discotech does a discotheque day where they announce new licenses. Mm -hmm. I'm ex I'm halfway expecting Gal Queen Millennia to be So, so Submarine new. Super 99 was kind of like, oh, so close. No, I we, we missed the mark. That's a good license. I mean, that's a good All license right. right there. All right, glad you were still excited. I, I enjoyed it, picked it up myself. Uh, Selene arrives at Yaoi's apartment and they discuss the millennial spring. We, we quickly realized that these two are both in on what's happening here. And Selene suggests that Yao's done kind of a bad job as, as ruler. I love that. Okay. I absolutely love Because everyone is thinking, you've been running planet Earth for the last thousand years. Have you seen the last thousand years? Have you seen what's been going on? You're doing a bad job at this. Well, they do have Neo Tokyo going on <laughs> too right. in 4D microscopes. How bad was it? But here's last a, 10 years one of my biggest issues which I don't know if this is resolved in the manga, the series, and it's definitely not in the movie. How does she rule this planet? What are the implications? How does she go about it? Is she influencing politics? If if you run, if you are the ruler of a planet and no one knows it, are you actually ruling the planet? It's a uh, I don't a tough think call. you are. I don't think so. I, she it's, seems maybe to it's have... like a ceremonial title. <laughs> She's like Emperor of Japan yeah, like or Emperor. something like well, that. Well, I mean, this is where we're coming from, you know? I mean, I, it would make sense. Maybe she rules the earth on a spiritual level. It's it's super spiritual, bro. And yeah, that's seriously. new age. It's it new fit age. in, I guess. New age. Uh, but I don't know. I need to dig more into the manga. That's where my head's at right now because I'm actually having a lot of fun with it. It's got and, a lot of like weird Jules Verne shit like all through it. And I'm here for it. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, Jules Verne off on a comet, man. He. He was this this science fiction concept is going to be 200 years old in a little while. You know, he was the man. Tulane yeah. comes in and she's about to do a really bad job, too. She's she's on. She's sort of so it's sort of a sultry sort of play to young boys. It seems she's slowly undoing her cloak. There's a very sensual air about it. But then it's it's almost like femme fatale. She's. She's kind of reaching for this gun. Yeah. And yeah, all yeah, yeah. all Yao has to do is walk out and see that she's going to do it. And then Selene's like, oh, oh I got to go. Uh, uh, she Just pull off the hit. What what was stopping you? Maybe maybe Queen Melania is too powerful now that she knows well, she's going to do it. That is her sister. Well, she was she she's did a bad a job. Lot. She's got a lot going on up there. They both are doing bad jobs. Nobody's doing a good job so far in this well, movie. I mean, honestly, you're Queen Millennia. You, you've been sent to Earth to do a job. You've done your job. You're done with your job. You're going to leave. You're going to let Lama Tal kill all these people. Maybe I shouldn't do my job. Maybe I have to uh, oh, disobey my orders. And Selene, well, it seems that other Queen Millennias have disobeyed their orders in the future. We'll, we'll get to what we my concern is there. Uh, Glenn leaves quickly. Uh, Yao opens a sci-fi device, uh, sort of a sci-fi pocket book, and it plays a video of her alleged boyfriend, Farah, her destined love. Uh, and he's basically saying, I can't wait to see you, babe. It's been a thousand years. I'm so built up. I'm ready for this, homie. Let's go. And and she seems a bit eh about it. Yaoi arrives at the observatory, uh, is told she's late immediately. It's like, no, I'm early. 
It doesn't matter how early you want me to be. I'm early. They discover at the observatory, Amamori, who is, uh, we'll find out is Hajime's uncle, that La Matel is about to collide with the Earth. And like David said, the plot here, a planet on a thousand year orbit that typically passes the Earth. Um, how this doesn't completely devastate the entire solar system here is not really expanded upon. This yes. should happen regularly that the entire solar system is affected. In the manga, we find out that uh, it was an interesting plot because in 1982, the planets did align. Yep. Planetary uh, alignment. And in the manga, it is suggested that this is a forced alignment that's going to happen on September 9th, uh, 1999 at nine hours, nine, nine minutes and nine seconds. So this is a forced alignment, um, which does happen. That to me makes sense. It's left on the cutting room floor. I don't know if it's said in the, in the this TV is, series. It's all part and, of the DNA of, of what people were thinking about at the time, the harmonic convergence, the planetary. There was an entire book about this called The Jupiter Effect, which predicted terrible things were all gonna happen when Jupiter lines up with the rest of the planets, which obviously happened because the world was destroyed, <laughs> as we see. Well, there's a, there's a spiritual death and there's a physical death sometimes. Uh, maybe The gravity waves that. affected our brains. Yeah, it seems Speaking that way. gravity waves, La Metal is supposed to have a black sun trailing along with it. Yeah, it's that, also that nine comes, times the size of the Earth. That comes out later. <laughs> um... And again, yeah, where this it's is trans-dimensional. All, this is all right off the occult uh, New Age section of your local Walden books. Uh, you got your worlds in collision. You got your hollow Earth. You're well read on. And you got your somebody else is on the moon, which has nothing to do with this. I just love that title. Sure. But you know, there's there's a crazy theory that the there's a planet called Nibiru or a dark. It's a sun or it's a antimatter sun or something and every couple of million years it swings by the earth and kills all the dinosaurs hmm. i mean Fair that, enough. that's a that, it's a real theory yeah in that it has no fact whatsoever but i mean yeah. it's 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 a thing people are talking about the hypothesis, the hypothesis perhaps you want to say at that point you're right not a theory um but you know things in this anime they're so condensed and and even in the series which was supposed to be 54 episodes and i believe cut down to 42 or something like that 52 and 44 or something like that we have this compression and this problem also that the, that even the first volume wasn't really completed for them to to base anything off what, of what this I, is what i love about about the television anime and, and manga is that you see exactly how artistic production comes up against sponsors giving you money or publishers wanting extra pages or we gotta cut this to make room for this other thing it's commerce and and art just coming together and squishing each other into weird and unrecognizable shapes yeah you you say you love it but i'm guessing it's more of a, a fascination than a it creates an admiration. Interest. It creates look. I've seen a, there. There are a lot of of television shows where the guy got to do the creator got to do exactly what he wanted to do at all. That's times. not what I'm after though. And it sucks. They suck. That's not what I'm after though I've because when Taro changes. Oh yeah, Galaxy Express completely. Oh, it's yeah. the first thing I ever see, and I'm hooked into it. I made a, I made the world's largest English speaking community because man, of one movie by this man. Keep, and I watch this, and I'm thinking. This is the worst Liege verse thing I've ever seen. Everybody, We're gonna get into it. Everybody uh, keeps chasing that first Rintaro high. You Perhaps get Rintaro, and you're like, well, uh, everything. I've just never been this disappointed. Wow. We'll say so, that, and so you, you've never seen Maytel Legend. You know what? I haven't. I haven't. Oh, 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 oh. I think oh. I saw, I might have seen the first episode because Nazca's introduced you've never, in that. You've never seen DNA sites nine nine nine. I have, and I like it better. Oh. I do like it better. Actually, I wanted more. Um, we're gonna get into it. Yamamori appears saying, uh, "La Meto may be lifeless, uh, but the Earth is doomed." They seem to think it's lifeless. This is probably because everybody's in this deep sleep, and very quickly. After this uh, exposition in the observatory, the observatory serves all these observatory control room shots. Every time you're there, it's just, you know, you're just getting exposition. And so very quickly after that, we see and what is revealed to be later an antimatter explosion that destroys the factory that Hajime's parents work at, which in the manga, we get this page like two. Yeah. And yeah, and, and in the anime series, we get it episode two. Yeah, it's really And I'm wondering, why are we delaying this? 
Why do we believe that exposition makes us care about characters? It, for me, it does not. An explosion and being told later why the explosion happens, that gets me hooked and I'm starting to care. I'm starting, oh wow, his parents are dead now. Hajime, I, I'm feeling nothing for him. We barely see point. his parents in this film. Like I, I think we- There's hear, a fade. We hear his dad. Yeah, right? we see his face. We don't but, see him a lot in the TV show, but he is. he does actually show up. Yaoi uh, finds Hajime crying after this in uh, an antique airplane museum. And we've got a bit of uh, Matsumoto's old Warcraft fetish on full display for us. And where would he go to cry? Inside the cockpit sure. of, a, of an old World War II plane, assumedly. She gets him to come out and they go back to the observatory for some more exposition. Uh, we find... Uh, Amamori, the, I don't know if the uncle has a name. We're just going to call him the uncle from now on for brevity. And we cut to the millennial spring that's taking place on Le La Mattel. These slug-shaped uh, spheroids we saw in the intro opening up revealed as hibernation pods. And Farah awakens and begins to rally his people as a presumed leader. He's the only leader on La Mattel that we've seen so far. Cut from this quickly to Amamori reading... Like I said, these ancient texts to Hajime about La Maitel, and they learn about the plot, essentially. Who is Queen Melania? What is their purpose here? Uh, Yayaoi appears quickly and reveals that they want to go to Tokyo. And Hajime asks her, hey, if we can we find this Queen Melania? And yeah, we're all in the audience going, ask her. you just did, pal. Because um, there's no mystery. Yamori appears and summons Yayaoi to leave. Who is Yamori? Why do we, why has this person got control of Yaoi? Isn't she just an employee at an, isn't she just like a scientist working? Why is nobody really confused about this person? Why is he okay to be here? And his role is dramatically changed once again from the manga, really seems to be forced in uh, because we're not going to get so much action or storytelling in the cavern that we see later. He's forced to the surface to be a character here. He's got it, you have to get him into the narrative so that he can be the, you can get that love triangle. Yeah. That, that romantic triangle. Oh yeah, ooh, and maybe that's a big part too. I don't know how prevalent this love triangle is in the manga. Uh, I have not seen any love budding in the manga yet, like four or five issues. I in, so. do not recall that happening at all in the television show, but. It's been a while. Oh, yeah. So we've got this forced it's love triangle. Not, not necessary. Completely. And I, I do want to point out, uh, Legend of uh, that Cyborg 009 movie also has kind of a, a forced romantic business that is just completely, uh, again, completely. Tasteless. It's not tasteless. It's like. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say. This is not, again, not necessary. <laughs> I, I would say it's forced purely well, I, for... I, I don't know how much Cyborg 009 you've seen, but if you confess your love for Joe Shinomura, uh, Cyborg 009, you are going to die. And so they return, uh, Yamori and Yayaoi, to the uh, beautiful apartment that she has. They uh, She quickly goes into the uh, cloak control room and speaks with Farah. Farah's excited to see Prometheum 2. Uh, but Yaoi is concerned about what's happening. Why is Lametto going to hit the earth? Uh, but Farah's just like, don't worry about that, babe. Like, come on, it's eternal spring. We're gonna, you know, right? We're gonna, we right? We got this. <laughs> We're gonna have a good time, girl. She's kind of like, mm, don't kiss me right now with your, I guess this, they're able to kind of have the relations hologram, through, the, through the physical hologram. Um, maybe a plasma, I don't know. And so uh, Lametel's planetary ring makes contact with the Earth. And we are just seeing this bombardment of asteroids, which oh, yeah. kind of, to me, signals the same as the planet bombs in uh, Space Battleship similar, Yamato. Yeah. Well, this is where the film really, you know, you're, you're, we're kind of promised a disaster movie. And this is sure. where the film is like, oh, no, we are a disaster movie. And we have all this disaster going on. And I'm laughing. Why am I laughing? Why do I find this disaster humorous? Is it because I'm a callow, heartless person? I don't know. I didn't laugh at Galaxy Express 3.9 when their Deus Ex Machina disasters happened continually over and over again. I was cry I was near tears. 
I have not been given any emotional connection to these characters to well, care whether or not Hajime just gets crushed by an asteroid right there and we can just be done with we don't We don't see any people in this Tokyo. Yeah. You're right. It's we very barren. Do not. And, and I don't know if you've been to Tokyo. There's a few people. It, it's a little we bit. Get, it's a busy we get town. A little bit of it when the factory explodes. Yeah. You and get they, people crowding around. They explain uh, later why we don't see any people, but I oh. feel like you need an establishing shot of a bustling <laughs> Tokyo. You know? I didn't put that together, and we're going to get... I'll, we'll laugh more at it later. Now, I feel like um, that's... that's you, you need to give us that, and in a lot of films make this mistake. It's like, you got to show and not tell, you know? Yeah. I want to I see it. Don't tell me about it. I want to see it. So Hajime is is saying... Oh, the, the, the asteroids are hitting. Yaoi went back to her apartment. I've got to go, go somehow save her from asteroids. So he hops in a car illegally. I don't know. Maybe maybe he's 16 and he's able to these drive are, this hover bike-ish these sort are, of. These are self-driving cars. It's the future. Mm, I don't know about that because I'm pretty sure he's like Tesla. swerving away from asteroids and things like that. He's He's got a bit of autonomy in this. Thing. Hmm. The, um, oh, as we'll see later, yes. And we get this Deus Ex Machina excursion, which again, I, I'm feeling nothing really about it. He arrives at the apartment and he exhausts himself climbing the stairs of this building. And I'm reminded uh, of Galaxy Express 3.9 when we have Tetsuro uh, desperately climbing up the fire escape to Maytel yeah. uh, against the police. But again, the, the score, the, the stakes, not feeling it. Uh, but it looks like they're they're trying to pull from some of that Rintaro magic that you were talking about. They're trying to take a piece of it, but they don't really seem to know what to do with it. And they arrive at the apartment. He sees the sci-fi pocketbook and Fair's picture inside of it. He runs out of there quickly and runs into the eternal manager, which I, I think that's a fun concept. If you've ever had a landlord, they may feel a bit like uh, an eternal manager of your living space. It is, uh, this Maison is Kyoko from Maison Koku. It's, you know, just, she's a, a nightmare figure now. If you've seen Maison Koku. <laughs> I have not, but if you got that one, let me know in the comments. He grabs Hajime very quickly and they escape through this hidden sci-fi elevator and they're heading down this sloping, uh, twisting tube and we get more exposition here. Hajime's heart is super pure. He's the purest boy in the whole wide world and uh, he, this is this concept of purity in anime and Matsumoto's guilty of it even in his manga, this very amplified a, idealism on he's children. Got a, he's got a big heart, you know? He, he went back in the face of uh, asteroid bombardment to sure. save his math tutor. Well, there's always the, it's I mean, a blend of naivete there as well, uh, which is always in Galaxy Express. I would not Pretty save my nine. math tutor. I'd be like, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, he got that peak of her and uh, maybe he's feeling away. Are you in your shelter? Like, Good. See ya. <laughs> he doesn't know about that yet. We're about to find out about it. And uh, the manager says, like you said, people all over Tokyo have been disappearing. Okay. They, I guess. Is that your excuse for not having anybody? People are disappearing. Here? Uh, and this, I don't know if this disappearing thing is happening in the manga because we have, we we get shots of the cavern that we'll see pretty soon and, and it's all empty. So nobody's really disappearing yet. Uh, it's a little out of order, maybe just to cover up, like you said, for the sparseness of our shots. I don't believe, uh, I know in the television series, they do have shelters built inside the hollow earth for uh, the refugees, but I don't believe the surf, the situation on the surface gets so extreme that they have to actually fill them up. And to let you know what we're talking about here, uh, the manager drives this speedboat into, uh, they, they hop on a speedboat from oh, yeah, the yeah, ele yeah. elevator and they jut out and they are welcomed by this jungle filled world and streaming through uh, the river there on a speedboat. That's to show off how, how amazing uh, prehistoric this 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 Jurassic uh, Cretaceous type jungle is. It's got a lot of jungle. It's, it's ferns jungle. everywhere. Wow, it's so cool. Uh, in the manga, we're getting a little exposition on. Oh, there's elephant bones yeah, from yeah. ancient elephants everywhere, and you get a bit of that in the anime series. 
well. So uh, credit to the series where it's due. We don't get it in this. One thing um, that was weird about the manga is like, yeah, that elephant died last Tuesday. Yeah, <laughs> last yeah. week. Fucking so, excuse me? <laughs> well, later in the seri- in the manga, they give a lot of great exposition on how the cavern was formed. Um, they arrive at the base of the sanctuary and they meet a being of green light who quickly takes Hajime and onto a moving sidewalk through a sort of cave, cavernous place. And they see all along the sides these blue flames. And when Hajime sort of focuses his eyes, he sees that they are a bunch of mummies uh, of does, does the old... This, uh, this glowing woman, does she have a name? And did they name her in the, uh, the film? I don't... I, don't I believe her so. name is like I Future or something like that. But she's a it, lot like Crystal... She's, she's like Crystal Claire from 999. From she's Green. like Mirai in some in the manga, oh, I believe. Right. Yeah, future. Yeah, Mirai. Okay, gotcha. Um, learning my learning more Japanese every day, which is great. And we see all these Queen Melanias. They they've taken the form of many cultures: Egyptian, Japanese. Uh, apparently, this Queen Melania. There's not so many places to rule the earth as an out and about queen. That's obvious. So. Uh, This one keeps it on the DL. But uh, we do find out in the movie that some Queen Melanias, yeah, you can stay. You can stay and decide that you want your body to become part of the earth after your death, even though they've mummified you on the side of this wall here. So not a really mummification, not really conducive to returning to the earth. And this this Um, is where we see that there have been hundreds of Queen Melanias over the course of hundreds of millennia, which means... Queen Millennia has been ruling the Earth longer than there have been people on the Earth. Yes, she has. They've seen uh, in the manga. They they explain they they see every form of life changing with a little shot of a, a horseshoe crab. So which are see, still around today, that, but that kind of gives this character more like when you show a Queen Millennia as like a Cleopatra or or uh, Kaguya Hime, it roots it. it roots it in 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 human being life, you know, but to have the uh, Queen Millennia as being someone that has ruled over the earth for literally millions of years through all kinds of different forms of life, that that kind of takes it again into this uh, cosmic consciousness that transcends human existence, kind of new age um, sort of territory. So it is an interesting choice when they talk about, oh, Queen, the, the Lamitalians have seen Earth change over millions of billions of years, and then they show a picture of a horseshoe crab. We still have horseshoe crab. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was an interesting choice. Well, they're I, just hey, really not everything's perfect. Changed, you know? I'm not saying the manga's perfect, but, oh, oh, okay, they haven't changed, but that contradicts, you old. see where I'm going? I'm a little confused. And upon being told how the Queen Melania sort of works in greater detail by this Marai character, Hajime claims, ah, it's just like Princess Kaguya. Yeah. And this Again. comes from, if you're Japanese, it might make sense to you, which I, I'll forgive that. Um, but this is for the uninitiated, the te- from the tale of the bamboo cutter. And the story basically there is uh, a, somebody is cutting bamboo in a village in Japan way back in the day. And they find a baby inside of a stock of glowing bamboo. And afterwards, they're finding nuggets of gold in every chunk of bamboo that they cut open. And they, the family becomes rich. This attracts some prince suitors. So they court her. And so she becomes a princess. Uh, but eventually, aliens come down from the moon and they visit the earth and they say, hey, you got to come with us. She writes a little note uh, saying goodbye. She gets a cloak placed on her and totally forgets about everybody from from the earth and takes off uh and then the emperor oh she also gives the emperor with the note uh, an elixir of immortality which he's like i don't want to live forever if i can't have my princess kaguya with uh-huh. um this is kind of like a proto sci-fi i think uh so takahata got an academy nomination for making that film ghibli made uh the film in 2013 is that what you're discussing yeah have you have you seen it no i have not it's terrific no it's honestly uh, uh, you know, it's always been this Miyazaki Takahata, like, I'm better. No, I'm better. Takahata, I mean, it was his last film before he died. He knocked it out of the park on that one, I think. Yeah, definitely some to check out if, if you find this plot interesting at all, which I think the plot's interesting. And I well, say it, it's like the name of Queen Millennia is like New Legend of the Bamboo Princess, you know? So it's right, right there. It's like it's right there in the title. So a Japanese uh, viewer is going to be like, 
when are we getting to the bamboo princess? Yeah. <laughs> They're kind of grounded. It's like, okay, let's, it's like new legend of Mark Twain. Like when is he going to get on the riverboat? You know, uh, Hajime is taken to the queen millennia, uh, the queen of a thousand years. And somehow uh, he's not putting it together that this is his teacher. Uh, the silhouette, the the sort of backlighting that well, obscures we know, we know, her figure. We know full well every woman in a Leisure Matsumoto production looks exactly the same. It doesn't help. No, that doesn't exactly help. Exactly the same. And in the television either. series, like like we're watching this movie, and and Celine actually looks different. She's she's different looking from her sister. In the television series, her sister changes the part in her hair, and is otherwise Sounds exactly right. the same. Um, but and yeah, maybe like, that's an like, in joke. <laughs> it's like like Clark Kent taking his glasses off. You know, it's it's a it's if the audience is like middle go with it. If, if the audience is junior high girls, they have to be saying this kid's a idiot. He's a total. He's mentally deficient. He's, like there's a problem. Dazzled by her, uh, and he her, wants a four D microscope. Like no real beauty. I don't trust him with a stick shift. <laughs> um, so you should though. I, he's got you he's, find out you we, you're right you're you right and he's out. full of surprises he's full of surprises and so hajime pleads to queen melania please help us save the earth but uh queen melania reveals that they are now in a sanctuary which is uh, where people will be safe from the uh upcoming impact and that but that's only because they're going to escape the earth through this giant cavernous ship that we're about to see. Uh, and and this is not, Hajime is not liking this. He's he's calling this a cowardly act. They have a video screen where humans are already trying to leave the earth and getting blown up with the uh, asteroids from the planetary ring. And Hajime is like, cowards. <laughs> Dual cowards don't even stay on earth. Um, and, and it's not working for him. He's not a fan of this. So it's like the exact opposite of Captain Harlock, where the cowards are the ones staying on Earth. And if right. you're a real man, right. you're going to fly into outer space. How things change in 1,000 years. No, no, um, no. You've got to stick around Earth. You can't leave. And again, I don't know if that's the sentiment in the manga either. So, Well, you know, it's, it's, it's Hajime. He's, he's saying a lot of stuff. He's, we, can't, he's, we can't assume fiery what he's dummies. saying is, uh, you know, the author's thoughts you know he may not be all with it that that's true even though he is the liege insert as look, i see it the young boy through, is that he's, he's gone through a lot in the last week yeah everybody's it's true. a little on edge you're you're not wrong you're the not world, wrong the world he's his parents have been killed and the world is about to be destroyed and i still don't care but moving on we find out that the sanctuary is called a noah's ark yeah, which I find this interesting, and this confirms to me a bit of an influence of Christian mythos in Leiji Matsumoto's work. I see it most uh, obviously on display in Endless Orbit SSX, which is the story of Totoro, essentially, and his sacrifice that he makes and his resurrection as the Arcadia. And to me, this is signaling that Matsumoto probably read the Bible. Well, probably gave it a good well, read as a good source material. The, the Noah is, you know, Old Testament, so it predates Christianity. And the 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 true whole business. You're right, you're right. The whole business of of we're gonna put everybody on a boat, save them from the flood, actually predates uh Judaism and it goes as far back as ancient Babylon. You're absolutely right. The, the, That's true. He does choose the word Noah very it, it's in the specifically the, the epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, which right. Upanashtim, the uh, oldest man alive, is like, oh, by the way, I saved everybody on a boat once, you know. Perhaps instead of Christian, I should say Abrahamic? Uh, Abrahamic, Abrahamic. Sure, certainly, certainly, certainly. And we'll see um, uh, if you'll watch Final Yamato, uh, which is a film that is approximately 14 hours long. Uh, the Noah's, the, the flood, Noah's flood is referenced in that as well. And where, so where the bad guys are rescued by literal Satan. <laughs> I might point out. All right. Well, some to look, some to look put, into. Put that on your uh, list. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Haj Hajime spots his uncle in the control room. He's he's sitting on on top of the control room. It seems with Queen Melania, or standing with her, discussing the exposition. Here, we're getting more observ observa uh more control room it's, exposition. It's an enormous control room. I love those enormous control rooms. 
I'm you just this, this a huge space available. I like them too, but in this, they are just playgrounds for exposition, yep, yep, which yep, yep, bores yep. and frustrates me. But he does turn his back for one second on Queen Melania and sees his uncle down in the control room. Even I think even from there's like, yep. hey, how's it going, uncle? And he runs down and he says, hey, I just met Queen Melania. And his uncle goes, impossible. As if he like, did you not see that up there? They, just, he wasn't looking. No, nah, I guess not. He was busy. He's focused on the task at hand. And then Yahweh seems. shows up. And they're like, I just met Queen Millennia. <laughs> she's so, wow. And by the I don't way, even think she's can I get, obscure. Can I, can I get my eyes checked here, by the uh, way? Because I really need my eyes checked. I mean, there is some myopia in a lot of these Liege inserts in here. So, but he's not got a proper prescription yet. Maybe we've diagnosed this ahead of time. Uh, he needs to see a, an op optrician. Get your eyes checked. Okay. Yeah, brain chattering inconsistency there, but uh, they're, they're hanging out. We Sailor Moon doesn't even wear a mask and nobody knows who she is. Right, That's, right. She's uh, all the time. Which Sailor eyes. Moon? I mean, Venus which, wears one. Just uh, Sailor Moon, Sailor Moon, not not Sailor Venus or Sailor Moon. It was a joke about yeah. how that... That, that was back when she was Sailor V. Yeah. And so we cut back to La Mattel and Farah meets La Layla. And Farah uh, approaches first of many large scale rotational shots, which are extremely ambitious, questionably executed. Maybe, maybe shooting a bit out of the range of what was possible at that time yet. We didn't have any sort of 3D assistance with animation. It's a little shaky. I've seen people say you cannot do those shots without a computer. Yeah, and the opening credits of Speed Racer uh, prove you wrong on that one. You know, even if they tried to rotoscope it, maybe I don't know what technique technique they did there. Maybe rotoscoping could you could maybe get it to work, but Tezuka it doesn't look like they did it. it. Tezuka would have been like, "We can spend a year on this." Yeah, that would look cool. <laughs> yeah, this the, is this is La Leila, the uh, the yes weirdo act, like the actual queen. She's she's in the TV show. She doesn't look like this in the TV show. This is a super creepy character. This the is childlike a, god yeah, empress. Yeah, I really like this character. She doesn't have a body. It's like we yeah. have this coat that's got Open. nothing happen, nothing happening inside there. It's it's looks like a the double halos. Yeah, are cool. double halos. It's not a bad design. I will say it's, it's eerie. Not a bad design. It reminds me of if you've seen Robot Carnival. There's a, a sequence with a lot of these robot dancing girl things that fly around and kill a lot of people. I will say, and I hadn't thought about it. Probably my favorite character in this movie. Yeah, she's she's just really just because of design, and, weird. and she seems to have the most motivation of any character. She knows yeah. what she wants to do. She is not conflicted. She is one hundred percent on the on 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 task. And we find out that Farah has been deceiving Queen Melania uh, under the orders of. La Layla, and uh, we also learned that Lamenta will create a, a most ephemeral bridge between the Earth and La Metal. Um, Which kind of seems like a contradiction in terms. An ephemeral bridge? That's Yeah, it's just for a little while. <laughs> it's not a permanent I, okay. bridge. It's, it's most an ephemeral bridge. It's like, like when you're crossing the Rhine and you've got to do it with your Bailey bridges. It's not a permanent bridge. And and so they're going to use this to transport all the Limitalians to Earth to obtain an eternal spring. Even though we we, we got four seasons here, I mean, is it going to be eternal? I don't I don't know. It's probably something they should have thought about doing fifty or a hundred thousand years ago. Well, they're they're doing it I, now for a specific reason, which I do oh, at that's least right, that's right. give them some credit in the storytelling there. They um, waited until the last minute, the yes. literal last minute, to do this. And so Farah goes and he rallies the Lamitalians for their invasion, hyping up the squad. We're going to take this. We're going to jack to Earth. And so uh, we cut quickly from that to Hajime's uncle, uh, noting Lamitel's orbit is changing. Are the Lamitalians in charge of the orbit? I, here? Believe, I believe they are to some extent. I mean, that's and that an assumption. Makes my brain hurt because even though we get the explanation that we just talked about, that they're waiting to the last second because they're about to be 
hurled into space or something bad's going to happen with their orbit finally. Why don't they just make it change more and fix things? Why they are so powerful yet so weak and it's so inconsistent that I don't plot, plot, care. Plot device, uh, uh, you know, it's only that strong. It's not any stronger. It's just strong enough. To, to fake out the, it's like a game of interplanetary yeah. chicken. And then all of a sudden they're like, eh, fooled you. Selene, though, appears again. And she visits the Queen Melania sanctuary. Uh, for somebody who just tried to kill Queen Melania, she gets in there pretty easily. She, she snuck draw, in. She didn't draw the pistol. <laughs> she just she touched it. She thought about it. it. She thought about it, but she didn't do it. I almost think they're, they're kind of telepathically communicating at this point. Um, and the sisters uh, admit to each other that they killed Hajime's parents, both of them, by ordering these conflicting parts for the respective vessels. Now, I can totally agree with this because if you've ever worked with two different clients, <laughs> you get two orders that do not get along with each other. And mm. the sales department is like, we have to finish this order. And then the antimatter generator or whatever explodes, right? That happens to people all the time. Well, you know, it's like pick pick which client you want to disappoint. <laughs> you don't want to. They, they both got what they wanted. They both got what yeah, they wanted, exactly. as we'll see here, exactly. which uh, it was came at the expense of the factory yep. and and some lives. This is and, why uh, you do not subcontract out work like this in a residential area. I would, like and, zoning laws exist for a reason, Japan. OK, zoning. Look into it. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And and Queen Melania laments this. Hajime's going to hate me. This little boy is going to hate me. I feel so bad, I guess. I don't know. They had this whole teacher, you know, senpai student relationship that we just, I don't care. I don't care. I don't, I didn't see it. It didn't make sense to me. We could have um, used one shot of them actually tutoring. Yeah. Maybe a flashback. I don't know. It's, I don't know, know what that would help. At this, this, movie, point, this movie is not concerned with normal everyday human being stuff. <laughs> it is. Well, let's just assume all that stuff happens somewhere else. We are interested in ethereal planets from beyond the outskirts of the solar system. Yeah, trans gigantic. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are not. They could care less. And so Celine reveals that she's uh, intends to fight the La Metallion uh, invasion, and she's going to lead a resistance uh, because they found out about her plans. And all of a sudden, Queen Melania is like, "You know what? I'm going to fight, and I don't care if the millennial." Uh, Millennium Thieves. Who? What? The Millennium Thieves? Who are they? Yeah, that's Celine's Now group. we that's know. The, the Rebels. Now we know. Now, and, and again, in the TV well, show. Because we've seen the TV yeah, show or like, the manga. You get half of, in my recollection, is like half of the show is, who are the Millennial Thieves? We've got to find out who the Millennial Thieves are and what they and want. And exactly 0.1% of this movie is yeah. about the Millennium Thieves. And I am so... You can't, agitated you can't at this drop point. a name like that without some, here's what they do. I mean, that's because that's kind of a cool name. This is a movie, completely separate timeline movie. You've got to work it in. What is the writer doing? What uh, Did they have to shrink the length of this movie too? Because it's already two hours. It does. I'm, just... I'm honestly like bringing it into two hours is like, thank you. Because <laughs> the VHS tape, yeah, here's here's when we on fan, one tape when we fans <laughs> yeah yeah when we fan subbed this in the 1990s yeah it's a T120 we got the script for Queen Millennia from a woman named Sue Shambaugh who translated a lot of anime stuff in the 80s and I believe is still doing really good cosplay like you're admitting to a serious crime sir what is that <laughs> wait what didn't you say you dubbed it fan subbed fan subbed that's, right that's not a crime. I, that's in jest. Uh, well, it is in a way if you distributed it. Um, if we made money off of it. If we profited from it. The FBI is listening. So. They have my address, man. No, seriously, yeah. seriously. Back, and I don't want to date. <laughs> I don't want to date myself here, but we we did have people back in the nineties who were like, "The FBI is going to get you, man." The FBI. We would put big things on the front of our our fan subs. Here's our address. Come and get us. Yeah. Nobody cares. Yeah, well, you gotta somebody's gotta have the rights and wanna charge you at that mm, point. No, and, I uh, wish they would. If if Toei had uh, called us up and said, Hey, uh, knock it off, we would have knocked it off. 
Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, it's like Queen Millennia it hasn't come out here. You're absolutely right. And uh, but I know Japanese. That's why I was able to. I, I legally bought it and everything's fine. <clears throat> Anyways, so uh, Queen Melania vows to fight the Millennium Thieves. I have the Oops. laser disc, um, by the way. And she's nice. vowing to fight. And but we'll later see. Are you going to fight? When are you going to? All right. You're, she's fighting. gonna drag her heels a bit on this uh, bold proclamation she's making. Uh, Yamori is confronted by Queen Melania quickly after she finds out about the Metallian's plot from Selene. And uh, we find that his name is La Elsu Meliu, which uh, may be a degradation of future there. I, I don't know, you Japanese than I. Uh, but he quickly reveals his unrequited love for her and we get, like you said, the love triangle that is is crammed Again, into this movie for waiting, the girls, I guess. He's waiting until the absolute last minute yeah. to, to drop this on her. Well, he kind of knows, though, she loves these primates more these than primates. the Le Metallians. Are they not primates? The primitive, the, the primitive, uh, primitive uh, human beings. It's primitive human beings? Is this a kind primates of a degradation just, you can, of the by saw? You can, you can insult people by calling them primates. I guess so, it, except when you have... Thumbs too, motherfucker. <laughs> your own no, thumbs. No, 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 they're special and advanced. Point your thumb at me. You point the thumb. You point the finger at me. You're pointing a thumb back at yourself. You know what I'm saying? He confesses to misleading her, and Queen Melania tells him, uh, "Just get out of here. Go back to La Mattel Somehow, I guess. I don't know. You. I guess you might have a ship. They've got spaceships. We quickly cut to Hajime's uncle during an earthquake. Queen Melania finally reveals herself to. Uncle, nobody knows what's going on. Nobody seems to put it together that even though now Queen Melania's bold face, full face is being shown to everybody at this point, we still don't know who's Queen Melania. I don't know who Queen Melania is. We get here one of our first uh, Yamato cameos as the earth is churning and the waters are clashing together unnaturally. We got a little bit of the Yamato kind of being uh, shrugged around here. I that's, think it's the actual Yamato. That is not, not the actual Spanish. Yamato. <laughs> That's an oil tanker. Well, it's it's a pretty obvious. It's got the red preference. hull and a blue super sub superstructure, but all all ships look like that. It's 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 maybe not a proper cameo, but it's a commentary. I'm gonna say, and and we'll get to the other one. I'll I'll explain more why I think that. And so we cut to uh, La Mattel forming the bridge with Earth. This takes 25 seconds of the movie. Yeah, this is a little much for me and it's kind of like this uh situation that i find in galaxy express 39 where we have all these beautiful sweeping shots shots that if you just animated it a little bit faster you, you want to get out you of wanna, here, you want to fast forward over the beauty is that oh, what the beauty is? of two like kind of poorly animated you, fuzzies you, you, touching you know, the earth speed it, it feels, up speed it up yeah, let's let's go. This could take 10 seconds and I'd be OK. The, the, the important part is that we see the electric potential Bang. of two completely different planets equalize. And this mm. is the equivalent of uh, you shuffle your feet on the carpet, you touch the doorknob and you get a spark. That <laughs> and, and the Earth is paying planets. the price. That the is. Earth is the only one paying the price of this, it seems. Uh, Le Mattel is eh, it's doing OK. Um, we never, we don't get to see, yeah, we don't get to see if there's any earthquakes or anything well, happening we, on Lama We Kong. see, we Well, see, it is nine times larger. We, you're right, maybe it's not as, it's as got shook, a little, so to it's speak. It's a little solider. And so Farah is commanding now the launch of the migration ships from La Maytel, and Queen Melania launches her sanctuary in response, and we basically have this giant disc of the earth launching out, and there's... A lot of beauty in these shots. Actually, this concept reminds me very specifically of the earth encrusted version of the Yamato that we didn't it's get. very similar, yeah. Uh, as the disc rises from the earth, water pours into the absent uh, cavern that's left behind. And we have that Yamato-esque oil tanker, as you call it, fall over the waterfall and just explode. And I'm getting huge vibes of 
snide sort of call outs to the Yamato franchise here. This happens again in the Harlock anime, the mystery of the Arcadia, when Oh, the, no, that is the actual Yamato, yeah. Yes, yes. proper, proper Yamato. Yeah, it's it's more of like a snide, I, I already destroyed you properly, but I'm just going to destroy you sometimes for fun throughout the rest of I think, you know, it's like you, you want a battleship, you've got a space battleship, you want a World War II battleship to come up, you know. What's a World War II battleship that everybody knows? I mean, the, the, the whole idea I of think, a, I don't know if the ideas a, worked in that order. The whole I'm idea saying, of a space battleship uh, of Yamato being revived as a space battleship predates space battleship Yamato. I think Matsumoto is looking for opportunities oh, yeah. to destroy the Yamato in his works. And he's working from that point to build it into the plot. I don't think or so. just in passing in the animation. I think it's, you know, uh, what if you want to put a Japanese battleship in your thing, what what Japanese battleship would you use? I Why mean, would you pick even Japanese? StarCraft players know that there's the Yamato? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's iconic. I mean, it has it has iconic value above and beyond its use as an anime series. It looks like a commentary to me. Yeah, I'm wrong. I speculate a lot. And Selen's ship takes off. Without hesitation, she's going to fight the migration ships. And to me, this ship looks a lot like a combination of Queen Melania, oops, the Queen Emeraldus, and uh, the Arcadia, either both versions. It's, it. it's a weird agglomeration of design motifs kind of shoved together. Yeah, and uh, maybe calling out that this Selene character is a bit of a proto uh Queen Melania, a uh, Queen Emeraldus within the Liege verse itself. She is the she's predecessor. A, she's a woman getting out there doing her own thing with r fiery red hair. And in the anime series, Julian let us know in our last episode about Queen Emerald, she takes a scar to the face. And so uh, she begins battle with the migration ships, but she is destroyed. They cannot face this threat. And Yaoi, uh, refuses at this point well, wow her battleships looking like it's it's not looking good yeah hajime goes hey are we gonna do something about this there's still time to talk she really wants to to sit down at the table and negotiate all this yeah i i have written here she dumb so that that's kind of how i feel about her character in general throughout this entire thing well the problem and is that if she uses her her queen millennia powers the movie's over but she's not even Queen Melania in this section. Well, yeah. She's but, Yowie. Yeah. Hajime's talking to Yowie yeah, like yeah. she has any fucking authority over this situation. She's not the Queen Melania that you know. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that if she, okay, let's end this right now. Movie's over. We don't I get suppose the tanks. so. We gotta, get, we gotta get to the tanks. But a bit of a plot hole that Hajime's asking Yowie to do something when she gonna do. A kind of a wussy uh, uh, attack between Celine's spaceship and the 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 uh, kind of nicely little designed uh, spaceships of the Lamatalians. It's sort of a proper sci-fi uh, this swing is, by yeah, of yeah. this of is where we ships. get it's it's nineteen eighty two. This is a science fiction anime film. We are going to have this scene in it. Yeah, we are not gonna not going to do this broadside attack. We have right. to do it. Yaoi being asked by Hajime, hey, why don't we do something? Uh, we can't do anything somehow. I'm not Queen Melania. I gotta go. And Yaoi leaves and becomes Queen Melania, apparently. Uh, like the writer was like, oh, oops, she's Queen Melania again now. <clears throat> Twirls um, around and does the Wonder Woman thing. She's yeah, the, the magical girl transformation. And, and she uh, goes off to a communicator like she had in her apartment to talk to Farah. But... He's not changing and he's still trying to put the moves on her like, hey, we're going to let's go. And it's like, you want to live with the humans? You want us to get along with those with those dumb savages? Maybe we should have like us this conversation. Maybe we should have had this before the wedding. You know, um, this is you want to get this out of the way. It's like we want to have kids. Do we want to live with the humans? He's trying to balance yeah. business with pleasure here a little bit, and it's not going so well yeah. for him. This is basically every episode of The Crown, by the way. Chad knows what, what what's The Crown, Chad? It's basically just a recounting of, uh, what was it, Queen Elizabeth the, what, third? I think she's the third. Okay. No, she's, and, sorry, she's the second. I don't okay. believe there's a third yet. So, so Queen Elizabeth the second and recounting everything that went 
horribly fucked up and wrong in the span. What a what a what a what a screwed up family they are, and how people come Ugh. into that family thinking they're going to fix it, and they get screwed up too. And it it's is based, just based an on avalanche. The 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 Nazis in the royal family may surprise you. <laughs> We'll leave it with that. Um, yeah, but we are getting a lot of this uh, royal... Uh, I, I tried to get a name for it last episode, and we didn't. Uh, Game of Thrones-esque sure, behavior. Sure. Queen Melania uh, not vibing with Farah right now, her destined love. Uh, destined in the way that it's like forced love. Eventually, uh, she she changes back into Yaoi, and she's walking through a hallway, and Haj Hajime finds her there, and he'd been carving a bracelet earlier in this in this uh, movie, and he gives it to her. He says, oh, by the way, here's a little bracelet I he, made for he you. He carved that out of wood in deep in the cavern in yeah. the whole earth, surrounded by these little Cupid doll uh yeah, interesting Matsumoto creation. I don't know if it's a Matsumoto creation. I need to go into the manga because it's actually a cute. They do cute look like cupid. Chow, like a what? Cupy, Cupy dolls. Okay, the reminds Rose, me of like Rose McNeil, uh, Cupy dolls. Still very popular. Mm -hmm. You can buy Cupy mayonnaise in your grocery stores. Japanese mayonnaise. Okay, uh, it reminds me of Chows from Sonic Adventure. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, but vice versa. Uh, but this is a very interesting time to be giving boy, like, loves adult woman gifts at this time. But he's like, this, now, I guess now's the, the time. It's this nicely carved. I will Shit's say. hitting the fan. He stops caring about human, the human race for a minute to, to fess up his, his emotions. In the hey, they, they, they might be going to be dying. It's possible. He it's doesn't want to not confess, confess his love before uh, yeah. he dies. Smoke him if you got him. <laughs> so after Selene is destroyed, she's lost her sister. Uh, Queen Melania has lost her sister here. Uh, Lalela commands the launch of now the Imperial ship, which is just seems to be the Imperial castle lifting from it's, whatever it's oceans. This sort of gigantic, sort of flat thing with big Matsumoto dials, actually part of the superstructure of the ship. It's a really odd. It looks like a, a, a science fiction book cover spaceship from the mid 80s. It's kind of like the 70s. Starship Enterprise, but instead of like yeah, a disc, it's a yeah. globe. Yeah. It's a globe. Um, and we get more of this jittery, large scale rotational shot of the ship, really, really punching above the weight class there's, of what they were, could do with the animation here. There's a lot of scenes like that in these big science fiction epics, and you're just. I, I feel like you'll see Final Yamato, and I think Final is the only one where they really said, let's get this right. Can we get this right for once? Yeah. The Be Forever Yamato is full of these, like, we're going to rotate around this thing. We're really not going to spend a lot of time on it, but we got to do it. <laughs> we have to yeah. we can't not do it. I guess maybe it looked better on the big screen, but I doubt it. Um, and uh, the Imperial ship fires on the Sanctuary ship. Uh, Hajime falls from the blast, and... Queen Melania quickly goes to tend to him and it's immediately revealed that she's wearing the bracelet. And, oh my God, you're Queen Melania. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My God, I'm so annoyed by this point. What are we, an hour and a half into this film? And I'm just, there's a nerve, there's a vein just pulsing out of my forehead. Um, and so uh, they discover... Quickly then, Hajime's running off to try and do something. I forget. I, at this point, I, I'm a little uninvested. But he discovers the label plate from his parents' factory in the sanctuary. And he we get this shot of Hajime's father saying, you've got to protect the earth. So apparently, we, we get to figure out that Hajime's parents were in on this. They know about Queen Melania. They seem to be some of the first humans to figure this out. A little bit of commentary. It's like, I, I was looking back at uh, Hajime's dad. He looks a lot like Matsumoto. He's got like this thin gray mustache, his receding hairline. It's like... Uh, Might be his own father, too. I don't know. what I'm going to turn into. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is, no, I was going to say, this is for Hajime. This is, like every, this is like what it's like for every kid. Every adult is in on it. They're in <laughs> on whatever the secret is. They all know what's going on. And it's only as you grow up that you learn, you find out, oh, this is what they were talking about. This is what adulthood is, or this is what 
the world is like, you know? And I guess that purity that, that all the adults comment on about Hajime or Tetsuro or whoever the child and, uh, protagonist is, they, that's, that's why the kids are so important, but you're, you don't know anything, but you're important when, because when, you're just a pure little thing. When they say pure, they mean stupid. That's <laughs> yeah. That's but it, that purity is important somehow because stupidity is how you win at the end of the day. It seems because they're stupid enough to all of a sudden think, Hey, there's a museum uh, full of old aircraft on the That's top right. of the cavern ship. No, Let's I, go and use that. I was kind of waiting for the film, and I don't believe they this like this scene does not happen in the television show. I'm waiting for the film to say, "Oh, by the way, we've had years of peace, and we don't have any weapons anymore, except for these antiques." Yeah, right. Like right. that's kind of a science fictional trope. I didn't um, even put that together, but, but I'm yeah, waiting it's another... for, and no one ever says this. They're just like, no, 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 let's use these World War II weapons. They're much People better. don't say a lot of things. <clears throat> Maybe they should have said let's or use said a different the one. The giant crossbow yeah. and the catapult. So this is uh, Matsumoto's World War II weaponry fantasy fight scene. His fetish on full display once again. Look. Matsumoto gets his cameo here running alongside a tank as if he was fighting in World <laughs> War II like Any, his Anybody dad. that has ever drawn a comic is going to be like, here are the guns I want to put in this. I want <laughs> yeah. the AR in this scene. I want an M16. These guys are all going to have M16s. I want to draw this M16. Somehow this is successful. Uh, I believe the Limitalians comment, we didn't expect them having these weapons. Exactly. Are they, are, are they only prepared to fight energy weapons? Could very well so be. They're, I guess the trope. Could a, a rogue could be asteroid could smack their spaceship, I guess, and they wouldn't be harmed, or they would be harmed by it. You'd think they'd bring in asteroids and think there are physical things in the universe to be worried about, not just crossbows and... M16 bullets. Yeah, but, but they haven't, they don't go anywhere. They stay on their planet. I guess. They're not outer space but, people. They are, yeah, so they've got like one spaceship. They've thought of everything except the plot hole. Um, didn't expect them to use water <laughs> or one weakness. Well, and again, uh, again, it's like, oh no, we're here on the planet Earth and in a thousand years, great new viruses have sprung up and now we've ooh. all got COVID and we're dead. Yeah, that that's something to the think The common about. cold destroyed the Martians, you know. <laughs> And we get our other uh, bit of Matsumoto humor here as uncle is firing a gun. Uh, I believe a plane flies by and his hairpiece falls off and we get the, I love that. the bald I love potato. That. I, I really actually, um, uh, I do like the character of the doctor. He's a, he's a great character. He's focused. He reacts to new information. He's actually really good in the television series. Um, even the even the Harmony Gold version, like, well, you know what? I'm not your dad. I'm going to do what I can, but we have to do. We have to save the earth. You know, he, he's a good character. I mean, the manga made me laugh out loud. Yeah. Uh, and and this doesn't. It's also, I, lost. I don't believe he's a drunk. I don't believe he's he's as alcoholic as some of the rest of those potato heads. No, he's not. He's not a drunk. Um, and and this, I should take it back. I was going to say, this this doesn't make me laugh. It does. But at the wrong times, as we're going to see here, uh, as, I, I mean, it was mildly amusing, the hairpiece falling off. Like, that was a little nod to Matsumoto humor well, that's in there. And I liked it, if you but watch, I didn't laugh. If you watch the television, blah, 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 the television show, he is bald throughout. So yeah. when you go into this movie, you're okay. thinking, why is this guy, why does he have hair? Oh, so is it always a joke that he's wearing a toupee? Well, because there are scenes of him wearing a toupee in the anime scene. Okay. Yeah. And the manga as well. So I'm assuming it's a gag, right? It's it's a good, it's a, it's a, it's okay. It's an okay gag. But, uh, and the eternal manager thing, that actually kind of made me, me laugh. Like, but that's not going to register with a kid. In Galaxy Express 3.9, we have jokes that will register with a child. Or even a 16-year-old's not going to laugh at the eternal manager. They don't get it yet. I feel like um, any any hundred story apartment building is going to have to have the manager yeah. is going to have to be some sort of a superhuman being. Defy space and time. And so Yamori and Hajime decide they hop inside of these warplanes and Hajime expert pilot. He already he's knows how to fly. Uh, what it, I think he's in a zero. Yeah, that would is. make sense. And then uh, 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 what's his name? The other guy is in Yamori. Is like a P thirty eight, I think. It's got the twin 
twin booms, the fus fuselage. Both right. of these guys already have this complicated skill of flying World War II aircraft. Yamori yeah, makes more sense because he's like a royal guard, basically. He's a pilot, he's... and if you're a pilot, you know how to pilot everything, right? I guess, yeah, it's, it's, it's like flight, like it's three dimensional, a, like a science fiction. Every every doctor or scientist you see in a science fiction anything knows everything: archaeology, yeah. physics, chemistry. Just he's a scientist; he knows everything. Jack of all trades. It's the so ancestral you're, you're, DNA. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you've, you've flown. You've flown a, a rocket ship between planets. Of course you can fly a World War II airplane, which is Probably. maintained in perfect working condition. <laughs> Over the um, course of how many <clears throat> centuries? Yeah. Well, those World War II planes are only 50 years old. Yeah, yeah but by the time they're like trying to say all this other weaponry, it's like the catapult. How the hell does that work? Oh, oh that's a reproduction. <laughs> that's got to be a reproduction. And, and the giant... Uh, the crossbow. It's, like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to see that stuff. Throw it in. It's fun, but uh, I'm laughing at a terrible time because Yamori, uh, he's, he's you know, his love doesn't love him. He's decided to pick up this fight and he goes, I'm just going to kamikaze I'm just this gonna imperial this baby in. And I laugh. I laugh. This is, we're, I'm a callow, not, heartless human, but. At this point, we're not capable of seeing that as anything. And then of course he's going to do this. Yeah, no, yeah. I knew it was always going to happen. And when he does it, I go, <laughs> Um, this, I can't believe that this, if yeah, but the thing is, I know Matsumoto can do this story and I will feel an emotional attachment to this character yeah. Kamikaze, but it doesn't happen. Not, no, he's, he's a, he's a blank slate. Yeah. He's that guy. He's got great hair other than that. The, the, the great <laughs> Harlock. Hair. Yeah. He's got yeah. good Harlock hair, but, uh, he doesn't like, he shows up in the television show and you're like, well, obviously this guy's going to turn out to be pretty cool, <laughs> <laughs> but this is effective. Uh, enough at least to get the Imperial ship to kind of crash into the Sanctuary ship and the Metallians exit the ship and their own uh, fighters that were flying around and they start to have a ground combat, ground gunfight with the human beings and the human beings are holding their own pretty well. well. I believe they're rallied by the uncle. This they're is, about to run away, but they say, no, we got to fight. See, this is where millennia of killing each other pays off for the human race. Sure. These Lamentalians, yeah. These Lamentalians are like, I have been sleeping. I don't do this. When I wake up, <laughs> we just chill out and then we go back to sleep. It might have so, wanna work that into yeah. their, a training program or something. All this yeah. running around, shooting at people, we don't do that. That's, yeah. we have robots um, for that. And so Queen Melania in this moment of uh, desperation rallies the former ghost all the blue flames we saw before in the moving sidewalk, those are still a ghost that she can mobilize. She's in charge of these queens because like, these are the queens that decided to stay on Earth No, I don't somehow. think she's, she's not in charge of them. She's like, hey, come and help me. They're still cognizant. They're they're still alive, more or less. Yeah, they're like, spirit, yeah, spirits. Yeah, yeah. They're, we, they're we love the Earth. We were the ones that stayed here somehow. What they are, um, and this is to put it into a new age paradigm, they're ascended masters. They've achieved the purity of spirit and they've they're on another plane of existence from us, right? So they are, and this is this is the nuttiest part of this. And I said this is a nutty movie. Star Wars, you're saying. It's yeah, Star yeah. Wars, you got the it, Jedi ghost. They're, they're ascended. Um, the nuttiest part of this film for me is not only do these spirit, the spirits of the ancient queens show up and start walking around and scaring everybody, and then they turn into little spaceships. Or they have spaceships that have all, no, they all have their own turn. spaceships. They turn into, they transmogrify into Well, the, spaceship. the spaceships can become yeah. the, the sort of uh, like, poltergeisty you don't, yeah. you don't need, plasma. Just stay plasma. You don't need to turn into a little spaceship to do this. I at least reasoned it that those were the spaceships that Queen Melania, uh, the Queen Melanius took to Earth, oh, but yeah, didn't yeah, yeah. use to return because they decided to stay on Earth. Sure, sure, sure. So maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I get that. I just like, you're already a, a spirit being who can shoot force beams. You don't yeah. have a spaceship. And they've all got these Egyptian faces on them. Yeah. So calling back to this new age uh, idea there. And so uh, like, Queen One. If, if Cleopatra was a space alien, I think we know. Julius Caesar would have let us know. It's like, hey, this chick, <laughs> this chick is a space alien, guys. <laughs> She had some alien parts. Anyways, so Queen Melania talks to Lalela, uh, but first stumbles onto a corpse. 
And I guess this was the new this Queen was, Melania. Was, uh, part two. At first, I thought it was the Eternal Manager who maybe put up a be. fight. Uh, yeah, who who cares? It's really who cares about this. She was there for a second at the beginning. She's there at the end now, and I I barely registered. Well, this, it this means her. two terms. Okay, yeah, yeah, two <laughs> one thousand more years. One thousand more you're years. Saying. Yeah. Um, and so let's not uh, change horses in midstream. So Lalela decides, I got a little bit more exposition for you. Uh, L- Lamento orbits a black star, oh, whatever, whatever that is. And uh, I, the I orbit is... Say, I want to say they're going for a black hole here. It's like an interdimensional sun that I... That's, that's what hole. I got by it. Yeah, the translation is a little wonky. I need to get into the... I don't know what the series says about it. I need to know what the manga I, says I, about it. The TV show, I believe, describes it as a dark comet. It's it's okay. a, it's a celestial body that exerts gravitational force and is dark. That's all we know about. It. It's very dark. Um, it's, just uh, I'm going dark. Space I, live. I'm losing my vision. It's going dark. Everything's. I'm scared. Uh, and the orbit is failing for Lametel. So they're just gonna get flung into space, and they're gonna have so eternal. This, so this is winter. why they're invading the Earth. Turns right. out their their sucky planet, which sucks actually does suck and it can they can kind of control the orbit sometimes but it turns out not enough to keep it from being flung into space well Uh, you know i'm gonna go with you on that one like seriously like orbital mechanics once you start messing with that you don't know how where it's gonna end yeah i guess so big problem guys don't don't Um, do it and the layla is also saying stinky primates are bad smelly buttheads and we are we are better i on the other hand i'm just a fucking head (laughs) yeah cloak obviously i am a superior being because i have Uh, halos and i have here she shoots a kind of cool uh halo shot at uh, queen melania's chest and this is where probably i'm like yes I'm like cheering for this childlike god empress to I, just kill this thing, I just win. Kind of feel like we're, we're we might be setting this movie up for um, like an Esper battle, like if you've seen Towards the Terra or any of these sort of mid '80s like psychic power people battling each mm. other, you know. And we're going to get some cataclysmic Esper battle. No, no, no we don't get anything like that. Um, this is the Leija Matsumoto does not do cataclysmic Esper battles. Queen Melania, we flash forward. Uh, they got to get her naked um, and put her on a table to revive the Queen Melania because they apparently don't have the power. Uh, you're saying that she didn't have the power ever to control the Queen Melanias, uh, but that's that's what they're up against now because these Queen Melania ships are doing yeah. uh, very well in the battle against the Imperial ship, and uh, it just seemed like they were they were helping of their own volition. And so Farah is being commanded. He's kind of hesitating. And Lalela is like, why aren't you just doing this? And all of a sudden we get the Rai uh, shot in the back. And we turn to see that Hajime has taken a a Rai shot at Farah. I know. And that's like, he shot that dude right in the back. He didn't say, back off, man. He didn't say, put it down. He didn't say, hands off. He didn't shoot the control board. He shot that dude right in the back. Yeah. Not not happy with it. Oh, cool. um, maybe he knows it's the destined love and he's trying to get in there too. Lalela's like, yo, what's up with that? What you gonna do? What are you gonna do about it? And Hajime is apparently not gonna do anything about it. He is like so disturbed or he like- He shot a dude in the back. You're a kid too. Your ch- children are pure. I don't know. Uh, I feel pretty and bad so, actually. Like I've never shot anybody in the back. I'd feel pretty bad about it. Maybe he's taken aback by his own it's, uh, it's against, unethical actions. It's against the code of Powerless. the West. He's been cowardice, whereas before he was calling other people cowards. So uh, Lalela's like, get your gun out of here. I'm going to like interdimensionally get rid of that real quickly. And but all of a sudden, right at the last moment, as Hajime is about to take the L, Queen Melania takes the shot at Lalela. She's got a gun now, too. There was a gun sitting right next to the table as they were trying to revive her. Probably a bad idea. This is Um, this is the first real action she's taken, right? This is her yeah, first, like, absolutely. this entire film is her voyage of self-actualization into thinking for herself and taking an action that we've seen. And as much as I don't like seeing Lalela take the L, I'm starting to realize, oh, these little Italians are all about to die. I'm yeah. okay with that. Everybody's yeah. going to die here. That's cool. Um, and so 
she's she's kind of I, I don't taking it back, but she's not killed. Not going to be a big loss for the the solar system. This planet. no, it seems not. Sleepy um, losers. Yeah, and, and so uh, Layla is not totally dead, so she's maybe going to strike back. But somehow, Farah rises. Uh, he wasn't quite dead yet. And he grabs at the halo of Layla, oh, yeah, yeah. which is apparently her it's weakness. Bad, bad news. It's bad it's news. It's not good. I'm just going to point out that he grabs both halos, like yes. the yeah, top yeah. and the bottom. So, so maybe he's he, it's completing a, a circuit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to kind of say there's a little bit of a premonition calling him Pharaoh, like a Faraday cage. Oh. Mm. Chad always here Tricky. with this, like, left field Because that stuff. is what you would want to be in if she was shooting electric bolts at you. <laughs> um, and that, that kills them both, I guess. So uh, this is, this is a, basically an electric safety movie yeah. about not completing right. the circuit. Right. Kids, don't, it's, even don't though these are, like... This middle teens that are supposed to be this target too but you know what kids electricity is dangerous don't stick the fork in the socket and so Layla uh, is sort of oh what a world what a world and her <clears throat> essence kind of goes into this big green orb and we get this weird face that again we're trying so hard to get the Rintaro magic out of this uh, from Galaxy Express 39 but I still don't here. That guy's got to um, sleep sometime, man. It's I don't play. You know what? And he's you got to move on. You want to do new projects. There, I'm not blaming Rintaro. Every, I'm blaming the studio for not making it sweet enough to do it. Every episode of a, a Toei series from the mid '70s is a Yoshinori Kaneda episode. Like there's two episodes of Captain Harlock where everything's really zippy and you're like, yes, come on, make them all like this. Like, <laughs> no, no budget, no budget for that. He's, the guy's got to sleep sometime. And so the old Queen Melania ships become these sort of ghost uh, plasma essences that go inside of the Imperial ship and then leave and rendering it. It's sort of like a samurai thing where we get the, the delayed impact uh, so, or something like an energy blast entering. I don't know what anime that comes from, that kind of trope. Uh, and just Fist of the North Star, maybe. You're, You're already, already dead. dead. Yeah, and then just explodes after contact there. It blows up somehow. Uh, the sanctuary ship floats back down into the earth, and Queen Melania confesses after this. She's on her deathbed quickly after this to Hajime. Hey, I killed your parents. But Hajime's like, well, everyone you know loved die. They're all dead, too, so it it's okay, I think. She didn't actually kill his parents. I guess. Uh, I mean, I placed an order for a for a part. It's you, not on her. You're you're very consumer friendly in this. He, opinion they here. they 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 didn't. I don't know. I I don't build antimatter equipment, but you know, she, she didn't place the order, order knowing that it would have that effect. But then there's Selene's part. Was there a conflict? It's not I, explained. I, there's I, intrigue with no real answers. I feel like they both put it in knowing, not knowing the other one had put in the order. Uh, I think maybe. that's what happened. But, you know, again, this is speaking to a Japanese audience in 1982 who had parents who likely built electronic parts in a shop in their living room. This is what I talk about when I talk about subcontracting. If you go to your Japanese car, some of those parts were built in people's living rooms. Kind of like the Apple II, uh, or the first Apple <clears throat> was built in a uh, garage. Oh, yeah, but it, it would be as if Apple was still subcontracting out to fa small family businesses. To well, they might have gotten some of their chips from some of those Japanese uh, living rooms. Who knows? Because they were ordering things from Japan to build those. All of a sudden... Oh, there's an entire galaxy that's going to run into our galaxy. Uh, we're not, this is a really big thing, like a really big thing, but we're just, we're just going to kind of go, uh, because it's not going to affect the earth. It's only going to go into the metal. And this was apparently the problem going on. I, I feel like there's, uh, this is a problem with, uh, again, finally Yamato has in the beginning of the film, it starts with a rogue galaxy impacting our galaxy. Okay. And then vanishing. Well, you know, things that happen faster than the speed of light, we can't see, you know? Weird um, how that works. It's weird how that works. So I, they, they explain it away in Final Yamato. They do. I They don't explain it in this film how a gal... A, like, please read a book sometime, guys. 
understand yeah. how this stuff works before you just- I feel like, Ma well, the problem again being that Matsumoto didn't finish his manga yet. He didn't get to finish mm. up the story for these people to make the thing that it's based off of. Yeah. And I'm gonna get into why this well, is such, this, this is, is a tra a multi-layered travesty. This is like a Game of Thrones thing, right? I mean, they, he didn't finish Game of Thrones. They had to finish it for the TV show. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I will quote uh, Hajime's uncle in this instance. None of this makes any sense. He's right. It's the most accurate thing said in this whole movie, and it's the only time it relates to the audience. The universe is, um, you know, actually, uh, speaking of Final Yamato, there is uh, a scene almost like that in Final Yamato. <laughs> I believe where it. I believe a, 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 a character pretty much apologizes <laughs> for <laughs> the incongruity of what we're about to see. The approaching galaxy is, has the black sun and the black sun is called Ra. So, okay, well, we got more e Egyptian lore in here. So I feel better, I guess. Uh, and the dimensional gravity that only affects Lametel. So okay. that's why it's on the orbit and why so, we're not, well, well, we were affected by Lametel, but not the galaxy itself. I believe, um, and I don't believe they get into this in the film or the television show, but I think it's, Lamatal is actually from another solar system. It's not yeah, one of right. our original nine or 10 planets. It's from right. somewhere else. It's got a, it dips into the uh, earth and it, and it does affect, it's in the manga, but not I, I, here I, because trans-dimensional, yeah, yeah, even I, though yeah. we're interacting with these trans-dimensional beings, I don't I know. feel like once you you get into that realm of science fiction where we're dealing with things from not just outside our Earth or outside our solar system, but outside our entire universe, like all bets are off. You might as well just call everything magic. I think Matsumoto seems to be able to handle it pretty well if given the time, and he did not have the time here. Well, again, yeah, he didn't like, he handed this off. Like he didn't like write this. Well, he didn't even have the chance yeah, to write yeah, what it's, yeah. the ending is based off of. That's a big, yeah, yeah. Game of Thrones thing. Um, Hajime discovers uh, quickly that Queen Melania has died. We've missed her death scene. So um, she did leave a farewell note. That's like, hey, sorry, I killed your parents again. I'm still feeling bad about that. Uh, Look, do you Earth is fine though. Do you want another 20 minutes in this movie? <laughs> no, no, and 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 we don't even get this was written. The story is originally a prequel to Galaxy Express three nine, but we know for sure that this continuity is not because we have uh, Queen Melania saying, "Guess what, though? The Earth is going to be safe forever and ever and ever, baby." And you know, we were the only problem she, that you were. She can't become Queen Promethea if uh, she's dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Which maybe she could have if I'm she would have continued to live as a ghost and then trans, and then we have machine bodies. Yeah, I don't know how the manga ends. I gotta, I gotta see that. Um, and so the funeral was, is, uh, there, let me, let me digress here. Was Queen Millennia started uh, originally supposed to be a prequel to Galaxy Express or is that a thing that has been retconned in later? I believe it's uh, the case. Because it feels incredibly like Oh yeah, I could just retcon in this. I could do this. It feels now, the scary. ending is different from what I understand. Ju we have it on good authority. I'll trust Julianne Peru, uh, who is a frequent guest with us and uh, runs triple-9.fr, a little plug for that. I don't, have you been to that site? I have not. We get a lot for it uh, over on the face our Facebook page here. Uh, great source, so I'd, I'd look into that. He knows his stuff. Yeah, it's a great, great guest. Uh, you should watch the other episodes. Watch the other episodes of the podcast, you and audience. Uh, the funeral scene that we have here, this procession, uh, the funeral features a, a ship in the sky. Don't know what that ship is. We don't get really any confirmation of that, but I guess it's a Lametal ship for, for corpses. And uh, we, we see Hajime, who is told to approach the casket and the eternal manager, I believe, says, you know, gaze on this face and they sh they pull it back and we see the true face of Queen Melania, which I guess we weren't looking at the true face the whole time. But Hajime says, it's the most beautiful face I've ever seen. And then just closes it back up. We don't know. The, the casket goes up to heaven, preceded by all these little blue flames that are the ghosts of the Queen Melania's, and, and they all begin to disappear. That's, and, uh, um, that's a very, uh, it's kind of a fairy tale thing. Uh, you're married to, to 
you're married to a fairy queen or you're married to some otherworldly being who looks like a beautiful girl, but you don't know what her true face is. Yeah. yeah. And you're okay. never going to know what her true face is. Sure. Or until after they're dead. I'm going to say, and, I do kind of like, I like how her death scene, he's not there for that. And that's a, that's a true, right. that's, that feels very true for, again, Japanese people of that generation. Well, it may also echo uh, Matsumoto's own experience. Uh, he lost his sister exactly. in what I believe is a car accident and was not able to get to the hospital in time. So yeah, very well I maybe. I think it, it's coming from a very real place. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, I think a lot of uh, Japanese people of that generation, I mean, certainly hospitals were regarded, you, you, uh, visiting people in the hospital wasn't good. You know, they've got a sort of a stigma around sickness and, and illness and death and, or they, they had, I, I don't know. I think things are changing greatly, but. Well, he, and he also laments it as a death of poverty that they weren't able to afford uh, the procedure that could have saved her exactly, life, but exactly. um, not sure that doesn't really play, at least in the movie here that we have. Yeah, that uh, kid, other, that kid well, is, she doesn't die in the other ones, uh, in the manga, at least. Oh, I was going to say uh, that kid is poor. Yeah. Hajime is poor. He's not a, okay. He's not a rich kid. We get uh, Hajime and his uncle, uh, uncle saying, you know, her death wasn't in vain. Uh, the earth is safe now. And Hajime goes, sensei. And we do get what is the best part of this whole movie, which is the ending song, which uh, is a bit of a banger. Uh, it's by. Forever, ever, ever. It's know, by no. uh, Dori Sadaka, who is Neil Sadaka's daughter. And okay. You don't There's know also... who Neil Sadaka is. Uh, he, uh, you know, had hits in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And uh, he wrote two songs that were used, actually three songs that were used for Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam. You know, fascinating that they would get Dory Sadaka to do this end song in English right after mm -hmm. they got, um, and I forget her name, but the, the, the singer to do the end song for Galaxy Express, Do Galaxy Express, which is an English Fair. Go Diego. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, do you Galaxy Express the end okay. title? Okay. Sayonara, goodbye, sweet memories. And oh, they got, um, I forget her name, a, an American singer to do songs for Project Echo. Chad, what are your thoughts on Queen Melania, the movie? Um, to be completely honest, this is, in my very limited experience, I see this as kind of like the biggest drawback in Matsumoto's career. I don't see there being a lot of like congruency with the rest of his like feel, his brush strokes. It just doesn't feel like something that he was invested in. Um, the movie specifically. Yeah, the movie specifically. I'm still working through the manga. I haven't started the anime series yet, but it's just, it feels not like him. Like usually he has a lot of these themes involving like uh, idealism and he works towards these specific ideals. And it's obvious what he's doing that. But yeah, it's mulled over. Yeah. And in this, it's kind of passed yeah. over. We get a flyby of ideals. There's an assumption that you've seen the television show. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, um, that's a weakness. Like, from other sci-fi genres, this feels like Lovecraft on Zoloft. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Throw it to you, David, please. Oh. I mean, you have a different view than Chad and I on this, and, and this is where I want to kind of hash it out. Oh, well, uh, certainly I feel like this is the most... I, I, okay, it's not the most new-agey anime film, but it is in the top five. Certainly, it's jam-packed full of these, as I said, the... the uh, new age uh, shelf at your local Walden books in the mall. It's a very 1980s movie. You could of go into, time. you can go into, yeah, it's very much of its time. You could go into any neighborhood with a, with a, uh, a crystal store uh, selling, selling crystals and, and rainbow stuff and witch stuff. And, and this movie would fit right in there because it's filled with ascended masters. And we've got a, the, there's a cataclysm coming. There's a harmonic convergence about to happen. We've got to be spiritually ready or or just go down to the shelters and get ready. I mean, a lot of these uh, kook groups will be, you know, the UFOs are coming on July 5th, 1997. We have to be ready for X day, you know? 
and they, 40 years later, we're kind of in the same spot. We're still in the same spot, but they still have X day every July. So I feel like there's a resurgence of this sort of attitude mm. coming out, especially with platforms like uh, you see it a lot on TikTok, I think, or these you get those yeah. quick little bites of information and these kids are getting told there's no such thing as a coincidence. I don't know yeah, if you've yeah, seen yeah. that meme oh, yeah, yet. Yeah. And then and then like the runner walks by in the background as soon as he says that, and, like bumps in. So, Sorry. <laughs> my, my my experience with um, like the sort of whole the spectrum of conspiracy, UFO, kooks, Kennedy assassination. I worked with a convention that involved a lot of those people back in the very early 90s. And they're constantly lurching from one, one revelation to the next. Like we're always about to get Oh yeah. The, we're about the to cost. find the aliens. We're about to reveal the truth. We're about to, you know, so that it, it's a it's a treadmill. If you want to get on a treadmill, it's yeah. a great treadmill, but but, but you find that anywhere. Fascinating as I, a topic to as, as an aesthetic yeah. for an anime film. It's like, oh, I said, like it's always fascinating to see a, a medium that's generally full of uh, nothing. Any but like this is set far in the future. It's set on another planet. It's set you know in Japan or whatever. But this kind of has uh, it's got things you can grab onto. Or at least you can say, oh, okay, I get where they're coming with that. Okay, this is the Hollow Earth. This is you know this is where they're going with that. And to have all that stuff sort of filtered through Leiji Matsumoto is doubly fascinating, I find. Like he was using a lot of the ancient astronaut stuff in Captain Harlock. Sure. Like, like, yeah, the undersea pyramids. And you know, and I don't want to say this is why Captain Harlock was so big in France, but France went nuts for that stuff in the 70s. Nuts for that stuff. And, and a lot of French people really like Queen Melania. Like there's a lot of them in the Liegeverse community in our group. Check out Aboard the Arcadia. And they will speak very highly. Uh, Julianne as well speaks very highly I, of I, Queen I, Melania. I, I feel like it's, it's you know, we're going to update the Kaguya Hime legend. We're going to uh, sci-fi it up a little. Uh, I do think the television show is vastly more successful than the film. With the exception of uh, uh, La Leila in the television show, she is not a creepy little girl. Like she's a creepy little girl in the manga. They I, they threw that out for the TV show. I don't know why. I I hesitated to talk about this, but is the name sort of referencing? I have no idea what that name is. I think it's La Leila. La Le? Like La Leil. Yeah, you said it, not me. You said it, not me. I didn't say it. No, I'm kidding. Say yes, it. I'm Lolly. Kidding. I'm um, kind of thinking Lolita. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. The the no, genre no, of no, lolly. That, that that was that was not a thing in in. It was uh, back in the seventies. It was, it was in uh, Japan, Hideo, and people. Uh, it was well known, Hideo, especially for mangaka. Hideo Azuma was 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 working on that, but I I don't. We have no real facts. I don't here, think it's supposed to be a lolly. Lolita, I speculate not Lolita character. It doesn't have a body, like it's an it. Right. Well, it's not it's, sexualized in any way, shape, or form. It's not no. nearly frilly enough. No, no. But seriously, that character is is uh, one of the things I like about it. Um, it. Actually, if you see Gulliver's Travels Beyond the Moon, which is a film I will always stand for, there are alien characters in that film that are depicted as these almost abstract expressions of human beings. They're just shapes. And this character kind of reminds me of like, I'm just... I'm just a flat two dimensional thing curved around, you know, I don't have any weight. I'm just a weird glowing head. The, the television show, it has a completely different cat like crew, right? Like it shares none of the, or almost none of the creative crew. Like it looks completely different. Yeah. It, uh, the music is different. The character designs are different. Well, the uh, designs are different. Kasuke worked on. Yeah. 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 But that guy worked on everything. <laughs> you couldn't keep him out with a court order. Uh, like so, but saying they're, the song was they're saying they're involved with the '90s project. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before I go off, David, because I'm about to pop no, off. No, I'm, I'm not done talking what? about what I like about it. I I don't like, and this is again, uh, this is the director. I don't know why they're having this guy direct films unless the aesthetic for making animated films in Japan in the early 1980s was make them long, make them slow. Um, is the Saint Seiya one slow no, as well? No, no, no. The Saint Seiya movies are from later in the 80s. He they're had the short. portfolio, I they're guess, short. right? No, the Saint Seiya films are, are tight. 
And you said that in the Grendizer get a robo. Yeah, those and, are tight. Those are mon- those are manga Matsuri films. Those were made for Toei Film Festivals. Right, they're, right. They're we talked of, about that on the last expanded, episode. Expanded like the mystery of the Arcadia Harlock right. film. And the and the uh, G nine nine nine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those are tight. The these films, uh Phoenix two seven seven two is the same way. Towards the Terra is too long. The Yamato films are all too long. Uh, Crusher Joe, I think, has one ending too many. I mean, I'm probably going to get pilloried for that, but that's just how I feel. All of these films, and there's a whole whack of anime films from that period that we don't even talk about, like Kenya Boy, which, again, blank look. And there's a reason for it, because it's terrible. <laughs> is this a, is this a African character? No. Well, no, it's about a Japanese... It's 1940, and a Japanese boy is raised in Africa by an African warrior to become an African, a young man, African warrior who rescues a white jungle goddess and stops the Nazis from building an atom bomb in Kenya. I was going to say, there is a lot of like it's Africa, pulpy. Japan connection yeah, yeah, through yeah, World yeah. War II. Yeah, super pulpy. Whereas the, this film, and I'm not going to say like, like I, I hate to say these movies are good or bad because Kenya boy is objectively a bad movie but it's got a scene where a giant snake destroys a village and then they was at least interesting giant. yeah it's got a lot of fascinating stuff going on in it yeah in this movie it's got fascinating stuff going on in it and it's surrounded by great chunks of time in which there's just exposition i like a tokyo that's jam-packed full of these weird turquoisey hazy buildings you know, those big Matsumoto sky, skyscrapers? Mm, oh, yeah, they're oblong. I, and... Like, there are parts of the movie that work really well. And then what what parts, parts do you think well? I, I, well, as I said, I like La uh, Lela. La Lela. La Lela. La Lela, however. Do you like her arc? Her, her, How that her character's great. I'll, I'll concede to that. I, I, La Lela, decent. But, you know, most of, of most of what the film does is done better in the television show. So are you? Like, so would you say that you derive most of your pleasure in this movie, having already say, approached it? Oh, you definitely have to have seen the television show first. And and that was the definitely. whole point of these movies was to bring in a think, new audience I, to the. I, I think the the point of the film was the TV show's about over. Here's a celebration of the television show. I mean, they already I, cut I the TV show down. I can't you know, they, talk to the marketing department at Toei Doga. I'm, I'm not sure what was driving what sponsor. Was this just the model at this point? Like, oh, it was. So, no, or, what? It was. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to have a, a character. You make a TV show, you make a movie, you make a TV show, you make a movie until suddenly they don't want this stuff anymore because we invented the transforming robot. And now we're going to do that for the next 15, 20 years. I mean, that had been invented. I think more of the shift there was on uh, so, soft, 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 Soft sci-fi yeah. to hard sci-fi. And that definitely... And my cross oh, no, is funny. No. They invented the cute girl singer and the transforming giant robot and things were never the same. So well, where would cutie honey fall on that? Cutie honey is a perv. It's gonna guy being pervy. What Good old gonna guy. <laughs> Love it. Um, but I would say that the, the shift for me seems to be we're done with uh, hardly explainable concepts that are wistful and fantasy oh, yeah. and magic. Yeah. And we want Umaru to to be uh, we want a salt deficiency in the kitchen subplot. We need to make sure that the realities of war in here, that's kids stuff. That's Matsumoto's kids stuff. We want it. We want it real fake robots. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe that was what was going on. But that's that's another time. Well, well I mean, th- that go, does play into this. You've got to sell model kits, man. And I, I've talked I, about I talked about why I think SSX yeah. was a failure in part because apart from the Arcadia and the Emeraldus and the Death Shadow, there is nothing. There's no merch. There's nothing to sell from that show. Quite and possibly. What are you going to sell from Queen Millennia? There's nothing to sell. There, there was a giant shift there with Gunpla and and more and more and more of an incentive exactly, for, exactly. for these That's where robot the toys, was. what toys were in vogue. But there's another possible reality here, and I'm about to get into it because I have a list of grievances, and I'm going to air them like it's Festivus Show right me now. on the Laserdisc where the movie hurt you. <laughs> it's the whole shebang. Um, so... 
this is the worst Liegeverse thing I've ever seen, personally. Um, you were saying you you had a couple examples. Uh, I think that Harlock Saga is better than this um, because at least I'm getting Totoro payoff. But uh, so it's hit your buttons. I would say it potentially destroyed the Liegeverse future potential. I have no attachment to any character shown here. I don't care. Uh, there are no emotional stakes set up for anyone at all. It is long winded. Okay, the Lamento, like I said, the Lamento Earth Bridge, 25 seconds that could have been, I I, so would, I got it after the first 10 seconds. You're, you're, I don't need to see this animation. This is filler for the animation studio to take a break to hit the two hour mark. And I hate it. You've um, already spent longer dissing this scene that actually it actually ran you're right because it makes me so angry you know the atmospheres are cool but they're just wandered because it's totally lacking impact uh you know, nothing is we don't get characters in these landscapes we get great right, lands barren we don't get characters in them because they're all sent underground where yeah probably the underground scenes have more characters in them than uh the above ground scenes and the, and the nothing's making sense the liegeverse explanations are Typically, they can be vague. Matsumoto will give you uh, piecemeal this, that, the other thing. He builds up a mystery. He's not interested in that, the nuts and bolts. Not so much, but we do get explanations. You get, you and get they that. are typically not as unsatisfying as what I got in this movie. And yeah, maybe it needed to be supplemented with an anime. But you know what? I didn't need that when I was watching Rintaro's Galaxy Express 3.9. I was there. I understood a good 90% of what was going on. Well, uh, more was filled in later, you gotta, but you gotta it was come enough. Up, you got to come up with another, another example because every film ever is going to suffer in comparison to Rintaro's Galaxy Express. Uh, Arcadia My Youth is explains everything to me well. It's slow. It's slow. Not this slow. More happens in Arcadia My oh, Youth. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, Julian, I think, told me in confidence I'm going to blow you up. He said he likes Millennia more than he likes... Uh, Arcadia of My Youth. I got to talk to you about that, man. I got to have a discussion. I, with I'm, I'm going to be honest. Arcadia of My Youth has real problems. It does, but it's Especially not. Especially in being nonlinear. Yeah. It, well, I. The, like the. the this the is first, very linear. The first English version of it, like cut out the whole Owen Stanley witch mountains flying over the mountains. That whole. Prologue. You don't even know how to say it off. <laughs> we were no struggling like the no Owen Stanley mountain witch of space. You want to throw oh. a witch in there because it just the Owen yeah. Stanley witch of space is such a great phrase. Uh, we get Queen Melania's identity yeah, at, spoiled like, instantly. At least we're not given like, oh, I, I read your race memory from we put your head into a jar and we read the memories of something I don't that happened mind a that. thousand years ago. It doesn't bother me. And it be, you know why? Because it makes me care about the characters. Exposition does not make me care about your character. They were able to tell me well, so much about who Totoro and who Harlock are by this background story again, that doesn't even take so place in the same it's, thing. It's show, not tell. Queen the, the identity is spoiled instantly. We lose so much mystery right off the bat. I know it's obvious, but come on, just just... Entertain me. Play with me a little bit here. Stop giving me everything. And if you give me everything like that up front, I'm not going to care about anything else that you're going to build up to a mystery later. Um, and the manga just has so much more action you know, in every single panel. It's dripping with action. And this is no, nothing it's like not, that. Is, it's not dripping with action. Why didn't we get Queen, uh, Queen Emeraldus the anime? This is a full, full effort by the studio to think, oh, well, we got 100 episodes out of Galaxy Express. Let's try this Queen Melania thing that's, out. It's, it's hot. That's a legit question. This is a failure on the studio's part to recognize a, an incredibly popular character that's, for the time. Seriously, that's a good, someone should, uh, so, you know, it would seem to be a natural thing to do. Oh, well, you know, obviously, um, I don't want to say it's Dinsu, but whatever advertising agency was financing all of this obviously wanted, we're good with this, or, or we don't own the rights to Queen Emeraldus. We'll do this new thing that we own. They had enough rights to use her in Galaxy Express 3.9, the movie and the anime series. So why was it? I don't, my a, biggest actually, concern. Millennia was actually animated by a different, it wasn't Toei. Oh, okay. A different branch of Toei. I don't pretend to know. Doga, you're saying? No, well, Doga is the film. Toy Doga is their, their film division. Okay. But there's a, a different, uh, what they call entrusted works. 
and I'm not sure what this means in the corporate structure, but I think there was somebody else had their fingers in that pie. This was in production. The anime series was in production while uh, yeah, three nine was, was running was because up. we get Melania literally one month yeah. after uh, three nine ends. So I guess practically maybe you I'll, know they I'll couldn't work you, out the licensing. It, my biggest fear. I just yeah. want to say my biggest fear is that they were afraid that a they that oh, Japanese kids don't want a strong woman. It could uh, be. Is that maybe, is that what we, maybe she didn't test well. You know, I mean, she you know, did well I'll, enough. I'll, look, I'll tell you what Japanese kids wanted, and they wanted Doctor Slump. That's what they wanted. I mean, and they got Slump they got with it. Melania. They did. The... That's what. That's where I was going with that. I yeah, mean, we can we can ask what Japanese kids wanted. We know what Japanese kids wanted. They wanted Akira Toriyama, baby. <laughs> they got him, and they still got him. Well, you know what? We have no more than a year earlier Captain Harlock winning. Uh, most popular character in Animage. So you say that, but I'm not convinced. That poll in Animage is rigged. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know for sure? Yeah. Um, if you if you spent the 80s reading Animage, uh, you'll notice Naushika always won number one. And then Nadia always won number one. Um, that poll is rigged, man. Oh, all right. Going, they got look, the end of Toei, I guess. You, you, you look at who is on the cover of Animage. And you'll see some shows getting the love and some shows not getting the love. Interesting. It's like Interesting. Roman albums. Who gets a Roman album and who doesn't get a Roman album? Because not every and, anime show got a Roman album. I'm remembering what Roman albums are. Do, Chad, do you remember what they are? Oh. They are basically these uh, magazine whole, I wrote publications. A article on it. I literally yes, wrote you did. The article. I probably sourced your thing. You want to explain what Roman albums are quickly well, here before we well, wrap up? Tokama Shoten was a popular publisher and they published uh, a lot of popular, here's, here's a, a, a magazine. It's a magazine sized book, like a soft cover book. You'd find a little it bigger, probably racks. a couple magazines. It's halfway together. between a magazine and a book. Yeah. Some of them are called MOOCs, but they started, they published one uh, at Animage. They published the magazine Animage, Fat Animation. They published an Animage special about space battleship Yamato, which was, insanely popular and they're like we can keep doing this so they yeah. did uh, okay the early ones were devil man mazinger z you know so there's some like like you're saying there's a rigging there because of the loyalty towards a matsumoto franchise it's that kind of built their it's business all about model the licensing all about the licensing like saint Seiya was ridiculously popular i don't believe it ever got on the cover of animage uh city hunter nope they, they did not have a Saint Seiya the Roman album? Nope. City Hunter? Nope. Fist of the North Star? Nope. Doctor Slump? Nope. Well, there's, oh. I guess there's more inevitability there in the, in the fall of Matsumoto's career than I give it credit for. Um, but I'm still not convinced that Queen Melania was the correct decision. To, I think, if anything, it put more holes in a sinking ship. Well, let me tell it, you this. After Legend of the Super Galaxy, Cyborg 009 did not get animated again for like 30 years. <laughs> so, yeah. like, maybe this is not the guy you want spearheading. Your yeah, property. right. He's not good at keeping the, the ship afloat as a yeah. very unfortunate. A how does this uh, rank? How does this rank in the, the Dangard Ace scale? You know what? I've seen about probably a third or half of Dangard Ace, and I would say, oh, Dangard Ace isn't low. For me no oh, i think dan Ace is competent um it's not a liege verse thing it's a liege matsumoto written project for a friend to get into the world of animation because at that point well i've heard actually mm. that yamato was popular as soon as like a year after it aired i heard that reruns were getting really good ratings it took it took a little while for it to get traction yeah and so around like 75, 74. So when does Dangard Ace come out? 77. So by that time, actually, Yamato was resurging oh, it was in, in its reruns. Yeah. From what I hear, what I've been told by the people who comment, it, it totally changed my worldview of how Yamato fared. I thought it, the movie came out and boom, but no, it, no. The, the reruns were getting good, good ratings. No, Yamato got its ass kicked by Heidi. Yeah, originally. Originally it, it did. The bell rung. Yeah, it, it, it was, was in a bad weird. time slot. But it, it came Heidi, back with a vengeance. You can't beat Heidi. Yeah. But uh, 
I would say Dangard's a tough comparison, but definitely below Dangard Ace. I, For my bottom, it's it's Queen Melania. The movie is the worst Liegeverse thing. Well, I've you ever have seen. you've got you've got some watching to do, my friend. That was our take on the Queen Melania movie. We will uh, maybe someday take care of the anime series. I'd love to start talking about manga someday too. So maybe uh, maybe I'll finish up reading the manga and that would be something I, to talk I, about. I would definitely recommend giving that show a watch. Um, if you want to do an episode about Captain Harlock and the Queen of a Thousand Years. Um, uh, Harlock's failure to launch. I need to do an I, entire thing about Z, uh, Viz and, and Harmony Gold and you know, every... Well, I, 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 you know, you know how in the episode in the, in the 78th show, Harla goes to the Horsehead Nebula, rescues Maya and gets back. And it's like, I don't know, three episodes, four episodes. It's it not a long arc. Unconstitutional. Like the distance traveled yeah. is just. Well, what? In, in Captain Harlock and Queen of a Thousand Years, that lasts for like 30 episodes. They just drag it out. Well, there's a lot of draggable material, I'm assuming, from the Queen Melania anime series. No, the anime, the Queen Melania anime is pretty tight. All right. I, mean, I, I got to watch it. It's, I gotta watch it's, it. it's 40 episodes. It probably doesn't need 40 to plus. Okay. Four it was going to be 54, 52. Episode 41 is a recap. So that well, that's doesn't pretty, quite count. That that goes on the uh, Galaxy Express 3.9 yeah. sort of uh, approach there. Um yeah, so some some differing opinions, but it seems like we do kind of agree I, that this I, isn't necessarily the strongest entry. Some of us just dislike it more than others. There, there's definitely, if you're going to watch anime films from that time period, they are slow. Some slower than others. They I'll are just not, leave it at that. not going to be jam-packed full of action. You have to uh, extend that that attention span. And it's tough. It's tough for guys like us raised with MTV, uh, you know, or YouTube videos, you know. But I still liked, I was there for every moment of Galaxy Express 3.9. And I know you don't want me to bring it up again and again, but I was there every, every, every moment. Every film is going to suffer. It wasn't impossible to make every a film, film that captivates me for two hours in that time. And this one did the exact, it repulsed me for two hours. Wow. And that's how bad it is. Well, well, obviously, you need some healing crystals. I yeah, <laughs> put them over my my third chakra. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me. You need to yeah. your chakra my root so chakra. I'll shove some crystals up my ass and I'll feel Boy, better. That's what I'm trying to say. And you get into it, Shataru Ishinomori, and this is what happened to Cyborg 009 is kind He's of. He's going to get his own fan page. The last, I really need to dig in. The last half of that series became we're going, you know, whatever whatever new age thing he was into that week. Well, that's a lot of material that's probably going to be on the cutting room floor. So if you were here for the live, thank you so much. If you were watching on YouTube, please consider subscribing. We are nearing that 100 subscriber, subscriber mark, and I'd love to have you along for the ride. We're going to make as many more of these as we can. As we close out here, uh, David, thank you so much for being our guest. Do you have anything you'd like to plug? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Terabee Funhouse. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Uh, I have a blog that is letsanime.blogspot.com and I'm on, uh, I'm on Facebook, uh, Let's Anime is on Facebook. Um, my wife and I do a website called mrkitty.org where we make fun of stupid comics every week. And this week we made fun of a comic book about a guy going from the future back in time to 1985 to stop a nuclear war. And it's not the Terminator. Interesting. So definitely go check out all that. Uh, Chad, okay. What do you got for us? Uh, what should the people look into if they want to hear more from you? My other podcast I'm on is uh, Into the Night, the Moon Night podcast. It's on currently episode 229. Um, let's see. Other than that, you can find me at Captain Harlock in the Arcadia. It's just a meme page, but you know, I'm always there for the funnies. Yeah, some, some good... Uh, uh, Edgy memes for edgy teens, a little bit there uh, some, from time to time. Good stuff. Uh, for myself, you can always check out facebook.com slash Liegeverse. And, and I'll plug now the Twitter as well. Uh, we got a little bit of traction yesterday, so I'm still feeling the high from that. Uh, Liegeverse USA at Twitter. And uh, for me personally, Captain Hardluck, you can check out my uh, Shonen Rap, my anime rap project. Captain Hardluck is what I go by. I'm the world's only, from what I know, retro anime rapper that's focused in solely on the Liegeverse. And uh, 
check out the first one, Friend Spaceship, the story about uh, Harlock and Totoro through uh, a very rap-centric spin of the Ring of Time. That's it for us. Harlock salute is what I always like to end off with here. Uh, yeah, David, if you'll join us. Everybody stay well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Be safe out here. Wear, Them, wear your, your, your stupid mask, you jerks. Imagine, oh, imagine COVID like it's uh, Lamentel's planetary ring raining down on us, but you can protect yourself with a face mask and a vaccination. You can go to the underground <laughs> cavern. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Have a wonderful day. Yeah. Bye.